The Rules Committee will come to order. This member day he hearing is an opportunity for us on the committee to do something radical, to listen more than we talk. This is a chance. <laughs> this is a chance for us to hear from our colleagues on both sides of the aisle about their ideas for the next rules package. Regardless of who controls Congress next year, I think we can all agree that running this house with integrity means listening to all members. That's what we're going to be doing here today. Uh, we took a similarly collaborative approach with the rules package uh, for this Congress, and I'm proud to say it led for the first bipartisan vote on a rules package in decades. That didn't just happen. It took time, a lot of conversation, and a willingness to acknowledge that no party has a monopoly on good ideas. I'm proud of uh, what we created together, the things like the consensus calendar to expedite consideration of ideas with broad bipartisan support, the diversity office to get the halls of Congress looking more like the real world, and the modernization select committee uh, to advance good ideas from both sides that get this place functioning better. And although we were already holding these member day hearings in our committee, we also require that other committees hold them too, so that all members had a chance to be heard across the Congress. Hopefully more good ideas now have the chance to see the light of day and uh, move forward. So I couldn't ask for a better partner in this process than our ranking member, Tom Cole. Uh, we come from different parties, but we share the same dedication uh, to this institution. Uh, we want it to work better, not for one political party or the other, uh, but for the American people, because that is really what this is all about. Uh, a well-functioning house allows us to tackle the issues that can make a positive difference in people's lives. And that is why we all ran for Congress in the first place. Uh, before I turn to our ranking member, I want to acknowledge that uh, today, that today is the first day uh, on the job for the House's new parliamentarian, um, uh, Jason uh, uh, Smith. Um, Mr. Cole and I said um, a lot about uh, 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 said a lot about uh, him to his predecessor, uh, and, and said a lot about him and his predecessor, Tom Wickham, on the floor last week. I'm not going to repeat all the stuff, but suffice it to say that our members spend a lot of time consulting with the parliamentarian's office. So I think we can all agree that it is fitting that he is starting his career as parliamentarian on a rules committee member day. So, uh, oh, that's good news. And so things are getting better for you. Yeah. So now I want to turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, uh, for any comments that he would like to make. Yeah. Okay, not, not hearing me. Okay. So I think we have a little bit of a technical glitch here. We're going to just wait a minute while Mr. Cole gets. Check, check one, two. I can hear you. Yeah. So, so, Mr. Cole, I said a whole bunch of nice things about you. So, I'm not sure if you were plugged in when I said them. Just now. Yeah, yeah I, I just said a whole bunch of nice things about you. Oh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, this is the pre hearing, so it's not recorded anyway. So, you're, you're in the clear. No, we're in the hearing. Are we? Well, thank you for saying nice things about that. <laughs> so anyway, I just said a whole bunch of nice things, and now I'm yielding back, I'm yielding to you for any opening well, remarks. Well, yeah. uh, I'll uh, reciprocate. I'll take your word that you said nice things, so I feel obliged to say nice things back, but they're pretty easy to say. First of all, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding the hearing uh, quite sincerely. I don't think there's any more uh, person dedicated to the institution than you, and frankly, dedicated to making it member friendly and uh, having a forum where we try to make this as responsive to each individual member as an institution as we can be uh, while we discharge our functions. Uh, you've been uh, a good partner in uh, defending the, the powers and prerogatives of the institution and uh, again, trying to position members uh, where they can be successful as they fight to achieve what's in the best interest of the people who sent them here and the interests uh, of uh, the country as a whole. 
So I look forward uh, very much to the ideas we'll hear today. I, I have no uh, uh, preconceptions. Uh, I would be shocked if I agreed with every one of them. Uh, but I appreciate everyone being offered. And I know the members coming to present ideas are doing it again in the best interest of the institution. So I thank you very much for making this forum available to our colleagues. Uh, I look forward to working with you uh, to see if uh, there are suggestions that uh, we can, in a bipartisan manner, work uh, work on together to try and improve the, the functionality, the flexibility, uh, and the effectiveness of the House of Representatives. And, and I know that we all want to do that. I applaud you for your leadership. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank you very much. The rank, Ranking Member Cole yields back, and I'm grateful for his uh, opening. And uh, we will be calling up our witnesses today in panels um, as they log onto the virtual platform. And so I'd like to welcome our first panel to provide testimony on proposed rules changes for the 117th Congress. We're delighted to have you. Without objection, any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. So our first panel is Majority Leader Hoyer, Majority Whip Clyburn, uh, Chairman uh, Thompson, Mr. Langevin, and Ms. Eshe. So uh, we will yield to uh, uh, our Majority Leader, Mr. Hoyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, and I thank uh, Mr. Cole as well. Uh, I, I think the House is advantaged by the relationship that uh, you and uh, Tom Cole as the ranking member have and the fact that both of you care about the institution. Um, and I might start my remarks with, no matter what we do in the rules, no matter what our rules say, if we don't have comedy uh, and respect for one another, uh, the rules will not uh, make us work better. Uh, they can uh, set great guidelines for us. Uh, they can be the rules of conduct. They can be the rules of how we consider bills. But uh, one of the things that we all need to work together uh, in the next Congress is to raise the respect for one another, raise the consideration for one another. And I think, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, you and the ranking member uh, reflect that kind of attitude and working relationship. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's members listing day on the rules package for the House and the 117th Congress. As we look ahead, many are anticipating a busy start to next year. I certainly do. Our rules ought to facilitate the House's ability to move swiftly to address the most pressing challenges facing our country's country. Others have spoken or will speak, I'm sure, at length about several of the proposals for next year's rules package, including the importance of our pay-as-you-go rule. But I want to focus on the restoration of congressionally directed spending. Now, that's a great phrase, and you and I both know the press and the public will call them earmarks. But congressionally directed spending uh, with the safeguards that Democrats put in place in 2007 and 2009. Very, very important that the safeguards are discussed uh, at the same time we discuss uh, the focus on congressionally directed spending. Uh, let me add, before I go further on the pay as you go, that we create the pay go waiver for emergencies like the COVID-19 crisis, where we have to meet a serious threat by investing in immediate priorities and needs. We now have substantial fiscal challenges, however, about that, and they will confront us in the years and years ahead. And we must work responsibly together to address them in the coming years. With regard to congressionally directed spending, after abuses in the system were brought to light, we implemented significant reforms, as I've referenced, that made it transparent and held members accountable. A couple of those reforms are included in the rules, and a number of those reforms included in the committee rules. Uh, as you know, we've restricted it to governmental or nonprofit recipients and required every request to be published online for the American people to see and judge. Uh, one of those rules is in the rules of the House. We made the system work and kept it honest. Unfortunately, however, when our Republican colleagues took control of the House in 2011, they used congressionally directed spending as a partisan talking point, unfortunately, and eliminated this valuable tool for Congress 
and surrendered part of our power to the executive branch. Tom jo Cole just said, and I agree with him very, very much, that the powers and prerogatives of the institution need to be protected. I'll speak just a minute about that. Restoring this power in Congress, I believe, is essential to restoring the balance of our constitutional systems of checks and balance. A major focus, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, uh, if I am fortunate enough to be the majority leader in the next Congress, will be finding ways to restore that balance. That is the balance between the executive and the Congress and looking how Congress can better assert the powers that our found founders intended us to have as a co-equal branch of government and as the sole authority on spending taxpayer funds, not the executive. Uh, that is why I think the restoration of the congressionally directed spending for projects uh, is so important. And my belief is that members of Congress elected from 435 districts around the country know, frankly, better than those who may be in Washington, uh, what their districts need, uh, what their states need. And we ought to return to a time when members can make that decision, but obviously have that judgment reviewed by the other 434 members of the Congress. The founders neither intended nor envisioned an expansion of executive power of the kind we've seen in recent years uh, through many administrations, Democrat and Republican. However, we have seen uh, that concern heightened by the actions of the Trump administration. This president, in my view, sees Congress not as a co-equal partner in governing, but as an impediment to his authoritarian tendencies. Uh, we must approach the issue of congressionally directed spending spending within this context. Since the elimination of congressionally directed spending in 2011, decisions about funding requests for projects and communities across the country have been made by the executive branch, uh, not by the members of Congress, who under the Constitution are solely responsible for the spending of money. Uh, Members know the needs of their districts, as I said, and are in contact on a daily basis with local leaders and civic organizations. That's why I strongly support restoring safe, transparent, and accountable congressionally directed spending in the 117th Congress. And I will work towards that end with whomever is the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. Several of the reforms we adopted during our previous majority are still part of the current House rules, but others were adopted as committee practices, and we ought to consider whether codifying them in the House rules for the 117th Congress. I want to thank Chairman Kilmer of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress and his fellow committee members, Mr. Chairman, for working hard on a number of recommendations for the next Congress, which include restoring congressionally directed spending. And I thank them for that. I believe strongly that this spending ought not to be, however, conditioned in any way on the involvement of entities outside of Congress. Now, when I say involvement, let me explain that I mean without the necessity to have a checkoff or an approval of a local official or a state official. This is the Congress's judgment. However, obviously, uh, we would involve all of those in communications for their advice and counsel on what spending may be helpful for local jurisdictions. Uh, I therefore uh, would uh, say that we ought not to have any requirement for outside approval other than the voting members of the Congress. I hope you will consider this proposal seriously, which can help us better serve the people and communities that we represent. Again, I want to thank you again for holding the listing day and for the hearing and the many important and positive ideas members are bringing to the table for next year. I would close as I began, however. I, I think all of us as leaders, as members of the Congress of the United States, when we get through this toxic partisan uh, battle that we are now participating in, Hopefully, we will be able to restore the kind of comedy, Mr. Chairman, that I experienced, and you were working in the Congress, and I was a member of the Congress, the kind of comedy that we not only had on the Rules Committee, but we had in the Congress of the United States. 
one of the finest members with whom I've served uh, in the Congress over the last 40 years uh, was Bob Michael, who was the minority leader. Uh, he was a partisan Republican a, a, from Peoria, Illinois, the middle of our country. He cared for his party and he was his party's leader, but he cared for his country and he cared for the institution and he respected and worked with in a positive way his fellow members. Uh, I appreciated that. I think other members appreciated that. And as a member of for over 20 uh, years in the Appropriations Committee, when I came there, it was a very partisan committee. And Silvio Conti, from your state, Mr. Chairman, was an extraordinarily good member, a passionate member, but also a very bipartisan member. Uh, and that's what we need. Not bipartisanship in the sense that I'm going to change my philosophy uh, or uh, my Republican counterpart is going to change his or her philosophy, uh, but we that we both have a philosophy that um, your ideas are worth listening to as are mine. And we may disagree, but we can do so in a positive way that furthers uh, the work of the Congress of the United States and our country. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be with you. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your testimony. We're now gonna to go to Majority Whip Clyburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member, uh, Ranking Member Cole and members of the committee. Thank you uh, very much for allowing me to uh, participate uh, in this members hearing today uh, to discuss uh, what may be uh, ways to take back uh, the spending authority uh, that we have on Article 1 uh, of the Constitution, which uh, in recent years have been ceded uh, to the executive branch. I joined this August body back in 1993. At the time, the appropriation process allowed members to direct funds to activities and communities they deemed worthy. This process directed a small percentage of the appropriated levels to be congressionally directed, uh, thereby not adding anything uh, to the cost of the spending bills. Ending this process resulted in federal agency employees with no knowledge of the residents or their needs deciding on the merit uh, of our requests. Even efforts to make the process fairer, uh, such as a competitive grant process, is inherently unfair because they reward skills rather than needs. I represent many rural communities, each with its own challenges and needs. These communities have limited resources and are unable to hire grants writers and lobbyists. What these communities do have is a congressman who lives among them, interacts with them regularly, understands their needs, and has been elected by them to represent their needs. When I was first elected to Congress, I was told by my state's Secretary of Commerce that until the water problems in my district were solved, there was little chance of attracting the levels of investments needed to improve the health, education, and welfare of the citizens who had overwhelmingly elected me to serve them. I heeded his advice. I used the AMR process to secure funding uh, through the United States Army Corps of Engineers to create and expand the Lake Marin Regional Water Agency. Now, I might add, I was criticized severely by many of the people uh, in this district uh, because that to them uh, was uh, wasting federal dollars. Well, we move not just to establish it, but to expand it. And it includes a six county rural area. Today, I am pleased to say that South Carolina won the first Volvo plant in this country because of that water system. 
And now they're creating what is to be 4,000 jobs in this rural area. Were it not for this water system, these jobs would surely have gone elsewhere. 25 years ago, South Carolina's economy was, was driven by textiles and tobacco. And many of these communities relied on them. Today, South Carolina's economy is driven by transportation and tourism. 25 years ago, South Carolina had no heritage corridors. Today, it has two. South Carolina had no uh, what we call uh, well, national parks. Today, South Carolina has three. The initial funding for the nationally acclaimed Call Me Mr. program designed to recruit, educate, and train African-American males to become school teachers in elementary schools. That program, started by Clemson University, was started with an earmark, and it's now a national program. Many of the communities of my district have been chronically neglected uh, over the years. I was elected to address these inequities and help these communities that have been mired in poverty for generations, help them get their fair share. Now, while I have spoken of, to a few successes, many other communities in my district are still struggling. They need clean water. They need sewage systems. They need targeted federal investments. Mr. Chairman and members, we can't put into our rules the safeguards needed to protect the process from abuse. We should prohibit a member from uh, sponsoring the project uh, that they or family members have a financial interest in. We should require transparency so that the public can see what the members have requested. I have always been proud of the spending I have requested for my district, and I welcome the public knowing about every one of them. As our district's elected representatives, our rules should empower us to request spending we deem to be in the best interest of the people we represent. We do our constituents a disservice by ceding to the bureaucracy the power the Constitution has given us to improve the lives of our constituents and help them pursue their dreams and aspirations. I thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important matter, and I'll give back. Thank you very much. Time I may have left. <laughs> this is the Rules Committee, endless time. Uh, I now yield to Chairman Thompson. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole. Uh, Mr. Chairman, 16 years ago, the bipartisan 9-11 Commission recommended that Congress should create a single principal point of oversight and review for Homeland Security. That should be one permanent standing committee for Homeland Security in each chamber. At the time, the Commission acknowledged that their recommendation to reform congressional oversight was the most difficult to realize, but was among the most important of its recommendations. When the 109th Congress convened on January 4, 2005, the Committee on Homeland Security became the 20th standing committee of the House and the first new one since 1974. At that time, the committee black letter jurisdiction statement reflected the reluctance of other committees to relinquish jurisdiction to this new committee. The structure of Committee on Homeland Security's 
jurisdictional statement is unlike any other authorizing committee. It does not include broad subject matter authority, like, for instance, the Armed Service Committee has over common defense generally. Instead, it utilizes a novel structure where it mostly limits Committee on Homeland Security black letter jurisdiction to six narrow drone activities within DHS. Over the years, the inadequacy of this jurisdictional statement has been criticized in independent reports by a host of groups, including the Bipartisan Policy Center, the Heritage Foundation, the Brookings Institution, George Washington University's Homeland Security Policy Institute, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. A 2013 task force report by the Aspen Institute and Annenberg Foundation concluded that fragmented jurisdiction impedes DHS's ability to deal with three major vulnerabilities, the threats posed by small aircrafts and boats, cybersecurity, and biological weapons. Yet over the past 15 years, under both Republican and Democratic leadership, that statement has remained unchanged. It concluded that DHS should have an oversight structure that resembles the one governing other critical departments, such as defense or justice, and that committees claiming jurisdiction over DHS should have overlapping membership. And just this past August, Mr. Chairman, the Atlantic Council in its future of DHS project recommended reform explaining that more than 90 committees and subcommittees have jurisdiction over all or part of DHS, and that the best window of opportunity for this will be during the 90-day window between the November 3rd election and the start of the 117th Congress on January 4th, 2021. Chairman McGovern, I could not agree more. There is no question that the moment is right for reforming CHS's jurisdictional statement in the 117th Congress. Next year marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, the catastrophic event that drove the creation of the Department of Homeland Security and in turn, my committee. Further 15 years have passed in which there's been more than enough evidence to support the conclusion that our initial and current jurisdictional statement is inadequate and undermines CHS's ability to fully execute its critical role as DHS's authorizer. Finally, we are in a moment where public trust in the department is at an all-time low. Given its role in the president's cruel immigration agenda, and more recently on the streets where protesters and calls for reform have grown more and more urgent. DS, DHS does not need dismantling, it needs reforming. But for that to happen, the Committee on Homeland Security must have adequate legislative authority to produce and bring to the floor a DHS reform package. I've been on the committee since its earliest days and I'm proud of the work we've been able to accomplish despite our jurisdictional limitations. However, the committee's woefully inadequate jurisdiction causes many functions of DHS, a wide reaching agency with collaborative missions in many fields to fall under the jurisdiction of far too, too many competing congressional committees. The resulting web of referrals have bogged down important legislation to shape the future of the department and to ring in bad policy decisions and the leadership of various administrations. Without effective leadership from Congress, including consistent reauthorization of the department, secretaries have been able to carry out wrong, ineffective, and dangerous policies. I am proposing, as chairs on both sides of the aisles have in past, that Congress reorganize the committee's 
jurisdiction to bring it in line with the goals of the 9-11 Commission's recommendation and give the department a true authorizing committee with authority to advance reform legislation and put it on a positive path. I recognize the challenge that presents and remember the difficulty in simply creating the committee in the first place. However, it's the right thing to do and believe that the time has come to do, to do it. With that, Mr. Chair, uh, I yield back and thank the committee for the opportunity to present uh, my position. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Very good. Well, good afternoon, Chairman McGovern, uh, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the committee. Let me begin by thanking you all for your commitment to listening to member feedback as you consider rules changes for the 117th Congress. As I'm sure all of my uh, colleagues on this distinguished panel uh, may be well aware, cybersecurity has been an issue of great importance to me uh, for, for more than a dozen years and uh, for more than a decade. I've made protecting our nation's critical infrastructure from our healthcare system to our power grid to our elections a top priority. I currently serve as the chairman of the Intelligence Emergence, uh, Emerging Threats and Capability Subcommittee on the House Armed Services Committee and serve as a senior member of the Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Cybersecurity, Infrastructure Protection, and Innovation. Congressman Mike McCall and I. Uh, also co-founded and we still to this day co-chair the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus. But I come to you today as a representative of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission to share our recommendations to improve the nation's cybersecurity posture. Congress created the Solarium Commission in the FY 2019 NDAA and I had the honor of being appointed uh, to this commission by Speaker Pelosi. Congress uh, charged the commission which comprised uh, 14 members, uh, four of whom were legislators, four deputy secretary level uh, members of the executive branch, and six private sector experts with developing a strategic approach to better protecting the United States from cyber attacks of significant consequence. We met for a year before releasing our report on March 11th that calls for an approach of layered cyber deterrence. In addition to the strategic vision, we delivered 82 recommendations on how the government can implement it. More than 50 of those recommendations are directed at Congress. Thanks in no small part to your leadership, Chairman McGovern, the House has included more than 20 of these bipartisan recommendations in this year's NDAA, uh, including the creation of a national cyber director within the executive office of the president. So I'd like to reiterate my thanks to you and your staff, particularly Laura Ishmael, uh, in working with us to ensure that these important proposals were presented to the full house for debate. However, one of the commission's most critical legislative recommendations is directed not at the administration, but at Congress itself. Recommendation 1.2 of the commission report states, Congress, and I quote, Congress should create house permanent select and Senate select committees, um, cyber uh, committees on cybersecurity consolidate budgetary and legislative jurisdiction over cybersecurity issues as well as traditional oversight and authority, end quote. So this is the proposal I put forward with my Solarium House colleague, Congressman Gallagher, for your consideration today. The challenges of cybersecurity jurisdiction were on full display earlier this week when we considered three suspensions relating to grid cybersecurity. Chairman Thompson was absolutely correct in the concerns that he expressed on the floor during debate uh, that the bills did not reflect the views of the interagency and could, uh, it could increase silos in protecting this criti critical uh, infrastructure sector. Chairman Pallone was correct uh, in his assertion that jurisdictionally, uh, the bills were squarely uh, in the remit of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Of course, underlying this debate was the fact that had Energy and Commerce included language to avoid the silos that the Solarium Commission warns against, the bill could have been referred to any number of additional committees. So I can think of no clearer example on how the, the committee structure is broken 
than that it incentivizes the kind of silos that are antithetical to the whole of nation approach we need to combat growing cyber threats. So our proposal directly uh, today uh, directly counters this stovepipe, the stovepiping by centralizing jurisdiction around cybersecurity matters. Among its many benefits, uh, it will increase congressional cybersecurity policy making capacity by encouraging staff and member expertise. Uh, it will uh, it streamline oversight from the dozens of committees and subcommittees that currently claim some jurisdiction over cyber, uh, and it will help Congress act with the speed and agility needed to have uh, any hope of keeping up with the pace of technological innovation. Mr. Chairman, I understand that matters of committee jurisdiction are extremely sensitive. I recognize that this proposal would represent a sea change in how we handle cybersecurity policy. However, I believe that it is inevitable. Inevitable. We have seen cyber attacks like NotPetya that have felled national economies. Uh, we have seen our adversaries invest their, in their offensive cyber capabilities. And we remain the country that, because uh, we best take advantage of the internet, remain most vulnerable in cyberspace. Whether in the form of a massive cyber incident or a more sustained death by a thousand cuts campaign, I believe this Congress uh, will recognize we could have done more and, and that the current committee structure is actively undermining our ability to do so. Mr. Chairman, what I'm hoping you and your esteemed colleagues will do uh, with the next rules package is take a page out of the Solarium Commission's playbook. From uh, the outset, we aim to have uh, the impact of the 9-11 uh, Commission without the uh, uh, precipitating event of a national tragedy uh, 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 on the scale uh, of that 9-11 event. No small task, but as former DNI code says said, and I quote, the, the warning lights are blinking red uh, again, end quote. This organizational change will not by itself present, uh, prevent a, a disaster, but it, it will uh, position Congress to ensure the internet is free, open, interoperable, and secure in, in, uh, in the decades to come. Finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, let me say something about Chairman Thompson's remarks that we just heard uh, a, a few minutes ago. First off, I would wish to fully associate myself with Chairman Thompson's remarks. DHS is hurting, and congressional dysfunction around its jurisdiction is, quite frankly, part of the problem. Secondly, while I believe a, a cyber committee is inevitable, I appreciate that it's a big step. If the Rules Committee feels more comfortable consolidating jurisdiction within an existing committee, I believe that that will uh, significantly improve the situation. And I believe the Committee on Homeland Security is the only sensible home. So again, I thank Chairman Thompson for his leadership uh, on, on many issues and his comments earlier. Again, I associate myself with him. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you. Uh, I yield back and look forward to answering any, any questions that you may have. Uh, and thank you. And the final person on this panel is Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. Uh, the two of you, I think, are a source of um, of pride to all of the members in the House by the way you work together. Uh, and all of the members of the committee, I appreciate being able to uh, uh, offer my uh, suggestions for updating uh, the House rules for the 117th Congress. Uh, specifically, I urge you to consider four changes. Uh, the first is to expand multi-factor authentication requirements. The second is to establish a working group uh, to combat surveillance of congressional communications. The third is to ensure all House documents are machine readable. And the fourth is to make permanent electronic submission of legislative materials. Um, I certainly appreciate the hard work of the uh, House staff to protect our cybersecurity, but I think we have more work to do. Uh, as just one example of where we are, you might notice that the ID cards that our staff uh, wear uh, have a chip, except it's not an actual chip. It's an image of a chip. And this measure is called security theater. 
Uh, so I urge the committee, first of all, to require multi-factor authentication for all access to the House network. Executive branch employees have IDs with real chips, which they insert into their laptops for multi-factor authentication. We currently require multi-factor authentication for remote access, but our requirements are actually incomplete. Uh, I'd be happy to share vulnerabilities with the committee privately uh, so as not to publicize them. Secondly, I urge the committee to establish a working group uh, to study and to combat uh, potential surveillance of congressional communications. On August 28th, I wrote to the Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, and the NSA Director expressing my concerns regarding recent allegations that Edward Snowden uh, surveilled communications of Congress while he was an NSA contractor. I asked how often the intelligence community has surveilled Congress or whether it has technical safeguards to prohibit such uh, surveillance. And um, most frankly, the responses to my letter really ignored answering the questions. We've all received letters like that, so I think you know exactly what I'm talking about. But sadly, this isn't the first time that the IC has surveilled Congress. Uh, in the 70s, uh, the CIA maintained files on 75 members of Congress. So uh, we know that our Constitution established uh, three co-equal co branches of government with a separation of powers. One branch being able to spy on another is totally unacceptable. Now, press reports also indicate that Washington is littered with stingrays. Uh, these are devices used to intercept uh, cellular communications. And while DHS uh, confirmed the problem, it's not clear who's operating the devices. Uh, third, I urge the committee to require all legislative material to be posted in a machine-readable fo uh, format. Uh, today, the bills are posted to congress.gov in a machine-readable format, but the materials for markups are posted online as PDFs, and sometimes they aren't even searchable PDFs. Uh, and why does this matter? Uh, if we receive amendments in the nature of a substitute 24 hours before marking up lengthy bills, we can't compare the amendments to original bills without manually reading the documents line by line. Uh, it's the 21st century, so we need to do something about this. Uh, with machine readable formats, uh, members, their staff and the public can easily analyze uh, amendments. And finally, I ask that the committee make permanent procedures for submitting legislative materials to the clerk uh, electronically. On August, uh, on April 16th, excuse me, on April 16th, the clerk announced procedures for a secure process to introduce legislation, add co-sponsors to bills, and insert statements to the congressional record electronically. Uh, this decision remains essential for the safety of members and staff. And my observation is, is the process is working uh, quite well. So making this change permanent uh, makes our operations more efficient. An electronic timestamp also means we have a paper trail uh, as to when items were filed. So again, I wanna thank um, uh, the committee for, for uh, considering my recommendations. I welcome any questions that the committee might have uh, for me moving forward. Um, and uh, I yield back. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank all of you for your tes testimony. And, um, you know, there's some, I think, some really important ideas here. Um, I want to associate myself with the uh, um, uh, suggestions of the uh, majority leader. I do think congressionally directed spending is something that uh, we should try to get back to, um, uh, not just because we know our, our districts better, I think, than uh, the executive branch, uh, but also because I think if the past is any, any, any indication, when people have skin in the game, when people um, know that uh, passing certain bills will actually make a difference in their districts, 
uh, we tend to get more bipartisan support. So, um, uh, you know, I look forward to this discussion uh, continuing. And uh, I, again, my Majority Whip Clyburn also uh, was in favor of this. And I, he, he was very direct and persuasive about the value of that. Uh, Chairman Thompson Mr. Lang and Mr. Langerman, I appreciate your recommendations. And we will work with you. Um, you know, I think the, the issue when you talk about committee jurisdiction is always a little bit delicate because it, it, sometimes when you want to expand your um, jurisdiction, it means somebody else is diminishing theirs. And it, it, even though this makes sense, it's not always easy to get everybody on the same, reading off the same sheet of music. But I, uh, you know, we will, um, in, in the coming weeks, our staff will work with your staff to, just to see whether we can begin these conversations, to see whether we can get a consensus amongst um, committees that may be impacted by a consolidation uh, on Homeland Security that maybe we can come to some sort of accommodation. Ms. Eshoo, I, I think all your um, suggestions are good. We will work with you. Uh, some of these, I think, are rules changes. Some of them may not necessarily be rules changes, but you know, maybe House administration or something, but we will work with you to try to make sure that they are all, um, you know, uh, to the extent possible adopted. So we uh, appreciate very, very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Um, Cole. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin to uh, join you in thanking all the members of the panel. This may be the most distinguished panel to <laughs> appear before the uh, Rules Committee. I mean, these are really substantive and significant members uh, from leadership through every every person on this panel. So I thought all the suggestions were uh, well thought through. Let me make a couple of remarks, if I will. Um, I'm going to broadly agree with the majority leader uh, about congressionally directed spending as an appropriator. I don't think he'll find that a shock. Uh, I will slightly disagree that I think it's any worse uh, in terms of the loss of power with this president as opposed to any previous president. This is to me is a primarily institutional question. I, I always point out to our former president, President Obama, uh, I think requested the most earmarks of anybody in Congress when he was a United States senator, but as soon as he became president, decided they were inappropriate and was happy to uh, be rid of them. I think any president would be that way. But, um, and, and let me emphasize, uh, I speak only for myself. I don't speak for my conference. I certainly don't speak for my leadership. But my opinion is we lost an important tool. I think the majority leader is exactly right. We lost an important tool. And uh, Whip Clyburn made this point, too, to both help our constituents who they send us here, and many of them are not in a position uh, to get paid lobbyists. They rely on their member to look after their interests. That's part of the job, I think. Uh, and I agree with, uh, again, both the majority leader and majority whip uh, who both made the point um, that face cards have to be appropriate. There's no question there's been abuses here in the past. We have members that went to prison for abusing uh, this system. So the idea of publishing them, making them accountable, not being able to airdrop uh, congressionally directed spending projects into conference bills, all those things make a lot of sense to me. Uh, and the idea of moving away from profit-making in in institutions makes a lot of sense. Although I will add this, just as uh, uh, Majority Whip Clyburn pointed out, a really important program uh, that uh, you know encourages African American males to go into teaching began with a single congressionally directed spending project. That's true of one of our most important weapon systems, uh, the Predator drone, which actually the Pentagon resisted. And this was a case where Congress actually had a much better idea uh, than the bureaucracy. And uh, our former colleague uh, Jerry Lewis had a lot to do with making sure that particular weapons platform is available for our use. It's been very valuable. Uh, controversial, I'll grant you, but unquestionably valuable. So um, again, uh, this idea of, of shipping power over to the executive branch, I think is a mistake. I think it's a failed experiment. Uh, I had these discussions frequently with our, our former colleague, former United States Senator, my late friend, uh, Tom Coburn, who was famous in opposing earmarks, and like like to call him the great the gateway drug to spending, uh, but I actually uh, made the point in one of our discussions. Uh, look, when we actually had earmarks, we actually balanced the budget. We've gotten rid of them. How close have we come to a balanced budget since then? I'm not suggesting that earmarks or congressionally directed spending uh, result in a balanced budget. I'm just saying there's not any relationship between the two. 
Uh, it's become a, a, a way to demagogue things. Uh, and it's cost us a tool and it's cost us power. So I, I very much agree with that. I'm very much um, interested in uh, Chairman Thompson's point about Homeland Security. Hal Rogers is, uh, any of you know, is one of my great friends, and he's wrestled with the appropriation side of this issue. I think those are really important suggestions. They are difficult, I will grant you. I see the same sort of thing, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, you probably should submit an idea to the Rules Committee, but uh, I'll give you a perfect example of this happening within the Appropriations Committee itself. Uh, we have the Indian Health Care Service uh, funded in the, the Interior Approach uh, Subcommittee uh, because it mostly deals with Indian issues. That seems like it makes sense, but it really ought to be in the Labor, Health, and Human Services Committee because it's part of Health and Human Services. It's the only part of that agency that is not controlled and has two practical consequences. The first is that uh, Indian Health is always underfunded. It's the largest item in the interior budget, which is only about $32 billion. You move it over to an agency that has $190 billion or a committee within its purview, you have a much better chance of uh, you know getting that, uh, that to where it needs to be. Second thing, and, and this is a separate problem, but I've actually presented it to the Budget Committee um, under both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, it's the only health care agency, number one, that we don't use mandatory funding in except as third-party payments. So it's really subject to the limitations of the appropriations process. And uh, that, that needs to be looked at. Number two, because it's an appropriated item, for instance, when we had sequester and we held Medicare and Medicaid, except for a very small part of provider payments exempt from cuts, uh, Indian health care was cut. Uh, and it was already the most under, underfunded part of the, and I don't think that was delivered, by the way, on anybody's part. We just treat it differently. So there's some real, uh, real merit to these suggestions uh, in terms of looking at redistributing authority because they have real life consequences. This isn't just a power game on Pap Capitol Hill, where you happen to be placed in the appropriations budget, uh, since each one of those subcommittees has a different top line, really uh, determines uh, what your prospects are. As I've told my friends in Indian country on many occasions, you will never get uh, IHS funded appropriately as long as it's stuck in interior, because there's too many responsibilities within that agency uh, and too little money. And, and uh, that's actually an area where the two parties have worked very, very well together for over a decade now, trying to do the best they could under that limited section. So again, I know I've droned on, but uh, just thought I'd take the occasion to put my particular favorite in front of people that uh, might be able to actually help me uh, down the line uh, as we work through this. But I want to thank each and every member for their testimony. I thought this was an exceptionally thoughtful, uh, good suggestions. A lot of areas here, uh, Mr. Majority Leader, uh, where you and I agree and where I hope we could work in a bipartisan manner because, again, uh, as the chairman pointed out, this is about institutional uh, uh, appropriate power and constitutionally derived power. This isn't about trying to score political points uh, against anybody. And, and I very much appreciate the spirit in which these suggestions were offered. I think they all have considerable merit and uh, look forward to working with my colleagues to, to try and implement as many of them as possible. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Perlmutter, any questions or comments? Yes, just a couple. Um, thank you. And I, I'm i like 100% uh, with Mr. Cole on this, both on the uh, directed spending. Uh, also, I do think, uh, Mr. Cole, you want to present some kind of a uh, rule change as to that Indian health, because it has come up uh on a number of occasions so i think uh, you brought it up here we ought to formalize it a little more um i remember we had two colleagues uh, one of them became my senator mark udall who was opposed to earmarks and jeff flake was very much and he would go down to the mic and he'd make his statements and they were wrong then and i told him so and i think it really has uh, hurt our institution uh, a lot of us uh, took pride, and I know almost everybody took pride in the ability to provide a, an irrigation, you know, help uh, channel some kind of a difficult ravine or help with a laboratory at a local college. And uh, 
And actually, you can take ownership of that. So as a personal matter, as well as a community matter, uh, it's very beneficial. So, uh, Mr. Clyburn, you're absolutely right, because it, I felt personally um, uh, like I was uh, more effective and more uh, um, connected to my district uh, with the ability to do some of those things for a Boys and Girls Club or something like that. Um, I'm with uh, Mr. Thompson. I served on Homeland Security many moons ago with Mr. Thompson and Mr. Langevin. I don't know if they remember that, but we had similar problems back then as to not being able to really do all the things that are required of, of that committee because we kept bumping into jurisdictional issues. And so I would be supportive of you two gentlemen and, and your request. And, and to Jim Langevin, that would affect financial services because we have a cybersecurity uh, component to that when it comes to the financial sector and the hacking uh, potentially and the disruption of the financial sector. So we should all get together and, and do that. And then and issues seem to be uh, specific and easy to do. So I just appreciate the testimony, but particularly on the uh, on the directed uh, funding, I think uh, we did our did ourselves a disservice uh, by doing away with that. And I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we always uh, are able to make time to do those things that are in our wheelhouse: community uh, jurisdictions, uh, congressionally directed spending. I highlight uh, Ms. Eshoo's uh, concerns. Uh, we are so resistant to increased uh, security measures uh, in this uh, place, whether it's showing your ID when you when you pass the, uh, 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 the congressional entry points or instead of expecting people to, to recognize you or whether it's two-factor identification when you're logged into your computer. By the time we all come together on Ms. Eshoo's uh, concerns, uh, it's going to be too late because something awful will have uh, will have happened. Uh, we have to uh, exert, uh, in the name of protecting the institution, uh, some some discipline to inconvenience ourselves uh, in uh, in ways that uh, Ms. Eshoo has taken the uh, the time and and in fact uh, made a career of of, uh, of of understanding and highlighting for those of us who do not understand them and and again will not until it's too late. So I just want to particularly thank uh, thank her for that. And uh, it's 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 not in our wheelhouse. We are uncomfortable going down this road sometimes, and it's easy to put on the back burner uh, until uh, until it's too late. And I, I hope uh, we will take uh, her, her her advice and her very pointed uh, solutions to heart, and and uh, and and make sure that uh, we we benefit from those. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Morelli. Thank you. Uh... Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Uh, I'll echo the remarks of uh, my colleagues in thanking uh, such a distinguished panel. I do want to note parenthetically, I find it hard to imagine anyone who served on a standing committee with Ed Perlmutter would have forgotten that experience. So I, I won't uh, ask for any show of hands, but I, I find that hard to believe. But um, I just wanted to note, um, I was thinking back uh, as Mr. As the, the uh, Mr. Leader and Mr. Whip were uh, Having making their comments, I think about the Clinical Translational Sciences Building at the University of Rochester or the historic Eastman Theater, where my dear friend Louise Slaughter's memorial service was at the U of R, or the Center for Integrated Manufacturing Studies, or the Sustainability Institute at RIT, Magic Spell Studios at RIT, which was for students in the um, uh, nationally ranked gaming, film, and animation schools, uh, hospitals, dialysis. Those are all things that I was able to actually get funded when I was a member of the New York State Legislature and what we called member items, which is effectively the same, different terms, same thing that relates to directed spending. Um, I don't think there's any question that you could meet both objectives of ensuring transparency and accountability and yet allow members who know their districts, know their communities the very best uh, to make decisions on priority projects in their regions. Uh, I thought uh, Mr. Clyburn's uh, uh, discussion of what he had been able to do in South Carolina was so right on the money because each of us, each community has challenges, but each are different than every other community. Um, and so I uh, would be a, a strong supporter of doing that. And, I, and as I said, I don't think it's mutually exclusive uh, that we have transparency and accountability as, as well as congressionally directed spending. And frankly, I think it's 
uh, so inherent in Article One responsibilities of the Congress and the power of the purse. So I would agree with my uh, very eloquent colleagues who have spoken uh, before and thank the panelists. I did have, if it's okay, I, I'll admit to uh, not having very much an, of a knowledge base on, on jurisdictions. And I suspect I, under, I appreciate very much the chairman's uh, uh, acknowledgement of the sensitivity of jurisdictions. But if I could just ask uh, Chairman Thompson, can you just give me a, sort of an example of how you and your colleagues on the committee feel constrained in ways that um, would help give me some clarity around what it is exactly uh, that you're asking to do uh, without uh, divulging too much, but perhaps you could just give me some well, sense of an example. Well, thank you very much. I'll give you a good example is uh, one of the challenges we have is uh, natural disasters. Uh, FEMA is one of those 22 agencies that's in Homeland. Well, but before FEMA can move into resources pertaining to a hurricane, flood, wildfire, um, tornado, or anything like that, uh, the Stafford Act has to be engaged. That gives FEMA the authority to go out and perform its mission. And may, may, may I interrupt you? Do you mean the staff in the uh, FEMA staff itself or our staff? Uh, the Stafford Act, which is- Oh, I'm the, sorry, I'm sorry. Right, which is the trigger uh, that provide the resources. Well, Stafford Act is in another committee. It's not in Homeland. So FEMA is sitting here uh, with all the resources marshal to address the natural disaster, but they are neutral because they don't have the authority to go and help American citizens. And sometimes our experience has been those authorities are sometimes days, if not weeks, before they are engaged. But if, if that authority was within Homeland, uh, FEMA could do its job day one. And so it's, it's those kinds of things. The other thing, uh, give you a good example, is with ICE, uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement. Well, if you have a problem in your district with ICE, that jurisdiction is in another committee because it's considered interior enforcement. But guess what? ICE is in Homeland because part of their mission is border security. So, so I get the call from many of my colleagues saying we have this issue with ICE in our district. And then when I try to explain jurisdiction, the first thing they said, but aren't they in Homeland? You correct. So what I'm trying to do is we need to get the authorities and jurisdictions to match. Uh, and I'm done after this, uh, armed services. Anything pertaining to the military goes to armed services. That's it. Agriculture, anything that goes uh, on related to agriculture is in agriculture. And I'm trying to get, not trying to, you know, I'm just trying to connect the mission with the authority and responsibility. Could I, I, those are very good um, examples and I appreciate that. So I, I do note that, um, again, my background is in the state legislature and we have sort of, you know, pretty discreet um, jurisdictions for the various committees. Although uh, at one point I chaired the insurance committee, I had a colleague who chaired the health committee. And so health insurance ended up being, depending on which section of law, could be in the insurance committee, could be in the health committee. So. I, you know, I'm familiar and I guess there's no perfect way to divide that up. I even note here in the house, um, healthcare could be, if it's ERISA, it would come under ed and labor, uh, comes under energy and commerce. If it involves tax provisions, ways and means is the situation you face more acute than some of the jurisdictional challenges that would, uh, face us on some of the issues like healthcare, et cetera. You think it's, it's it's unique um, and more of a bright line. Oh, absolutely, 
and, and, and it's a matter of, of function. You want the agencies to work. So much of what we do is predicated on being able to respond in a timely manner. And so that response is limited simply because the agency that you're located in does not have the authority to execute on that issue. And, and so uh, I give you another example. I'm done after this. Uh, family separation uh, that we had a big issue separating families from from others. Well, that authority is, is not a homeland uh, authority per se. It's vested in, in, in another committee. But the agency that created the problem uh, is in homeland. And, and, and so we're just trying to, to, to the best that we can, uh, tie the authorities and functions with the agencies. I and and it, it, nothing more than that. And, and you know, if it, the committee would like, I can provide you uh, with several other examples of what we're talking about, uh, just so we can serve the American people in a timely manner. Well, I will say, and I apologize for the uh, extended question, and thank you. This has really been very helpful, and I apologize, uh, Mr. Chair. But I, I and I would, I, I assume that some of this came out of the fact that, as you mentioned, 9/11 really gave rise to the Department of Homeland Security uh, as a New Yorker. I'm particularly grateful for that. Um, so I assume some of this is the developing of an agency and a committee that follows it. Um, so you're sort of getting shoehorned into existing law and existing uh, wires uh, that have, that pre-existed 9-11 in the committee. But I, I think you make a compelling case, and I, I really appreciate it. I can't imagine the frustration of having to have agencies that are under the jurisdiction of my committee or that you have oversight for, but uh, you can't really affect or you can't um, connect with on the issues that colleagues are and the American public is talking to you about. So I, I really appreciate very much your uh, your leadership and, and your comments here. The, the, the um, the last thing I would say is I, I agree with uh, my other colleagues, uh, Ms. Eshoo, I think you make uh, compelling arguments on uh, the issues of um, of electronic submission and cybersecurity. Oh, and I, I'm sorry, just to go back for one second, I apologize. The, the notion of creating a select committee would, if we were able to address the Homeland Security Committee issues in the way that you, Mr. Chairman, Ch Chairman Thompson, have suggested, would you then simply create potentially a subcommittee on cybersecurity? Is there is there no conflict between uh, what you're recommending and Mr. Langevin was recommending? No, uh, we absolutely. Uh, we created uh, CISA, uh, which is a cyber uh, entity that has responsibility across the federal agency platform. And so what we are saying is keep the mission of federal agency cyber security within that agency. The minute you pull it out, we start creating the same problem we had before we created Homeland, which is the siloing of information that ended up with 9-11. Uh, right. uh, and so we're trying to avoid that by creating a system where everyone is here talking to each other and not everybody trying to come with a turf uh, issue. The other thing I can say is all the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission report uh, spoke to that issue. And the only one we have not completely fulfilled is this notion of jurisdiction uh, for the Homeland Security Commission. Very good. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I apologize for the uh, length of my questioning, but I really appreciate uh, all the panelists and the opportunity to speak. I yield back. Uh, Ms. Lesko. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No questions. Thank you, Mr. Layla. Okay. Did I miss anybody? I, no, I'm fine. I've got, uh, I've just got a couple of things. First of all, I agree with directed spending, and I absolutely agree with Representative Eshoo's recommendations. And for Mr. Cole, um, Mr. Cole, I would love to see the Indian Health Service in labor HHS, I struggled trying to get resources um, for the Indian Health Service, as well as the Food and Drug Administration, which was stuck in agriculture. 
because they just were not high priorities for those uh, committees. Even when I went and personally testified, uh, it was just very difficult to get uh, proper resources. So I would even think about the Bureau of Indian Education being moved to education just, uh, just to get some attention to these really important um, uh, agencies. Frankly, the only reason the Indian Health Service during my years at HHS and the Food and Drug Administration um, the FDA ever got uh, significant resources was because I was Ted Stevens' doubles partner. And he helped me get resources um, for those two uh, for those two agencies um, because it was hard to get the attention of those uh, of those committees. So I just think that thinking through the right alignment is uh, just the right thing to do. Well, the gentle lady yield for a yes. question or comment. Just well, number one, thank you for your your focus on this and in, in your time in the executive and your continued focus on it. But uh, to your point, this is actually an area I will tell you where I would compliment both Democrats and Republicans on Indian health in the interior subcommittee of approach for over a decade. They've really actually exceeded consistently what the uh, Republican and Democratic administrations have suggested. There's just not enough money there. It's just a matter of what their total pot is. Well, exactly. And, our, and the second area that I should have mentioned earlier, and uh, your, your opinion on would be really valued. You know, a number of years ago, we made the decision, I think it was a smart decision, to forward fund veterans' health. So it's never at risk if we're in some sort of political spat up here. We haven't done that with Indian health care. Uh, and we ought to do the same thing, particularly if we're going to keep it within the discretionary budget. Uh, uh, you know, that, again, is something we just simply ought to do so that if there's a squabble up here, all of a sudden there's not a dramatic decline in the availability of health care on some remote Indian reservation uh, through, you know, where people there have done absolutely nothing wrong. We just haven't gotten our job done up here. So. Anyway, I put that, but again, thanks for your, your work and, and your commitment. Uh, you have such a distinguished record and it's much appreciated. Thank you. Generally, the yield back. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So um, uh, I, there are no other questions of this panel. Then I want to thank this panel and uh, you are all now dismissed. Thank you. I'm calling up now our, our, our next panel, uh, Mr. Davis, Ms. Washington Schultz, Mr. Klein, Mr. Castro, and Mr. Christ. Thank you for providing testimony today. Any written materials uh, that you uh, that you have, you can submit to rules documents rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing, and without objection, it will be entered into the record. Um, I now uh, recognize the uh, gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry about that. I want to make sure I was unmuted. Uh, I appreciate being here, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole. Good afternoon. Uh, and to the rest of the committee, thanks again for allowing me to testify today. 116th Congress has been full of surprises. And although there have been endless challenges, the silver lining is our ability to learn from them, to adapt and to make our institution work better for the American people. I'm here this afternoon to highlight three buckets of changes that the House could adopt to not only strengthen our operations, but pave the path for continued improvement. The first set of changes is a clarification. Mr. Davis, of Mr. Davis excuse me, can you put your video on? Uh, I thought I had it on, sir. I apologize. There you go. You're on now. Yeah, yeah. You're, now, in stereo, okay. you're in stereo and now in Technicolor. Okay, well, great. You don't, you don't want me to reread the rest of it, do you? You don't. Want, I'll, I'll start at the same point. Um, I, I do want to say the first set of changes that I'm asking for is a clarification of current House rules regarding the use of proxy voting. During this committee's hearing on HRS 965, I, I warned that proxy voting would likely be abused by members if authorized. I was assured that controls would be in place and it's being implemented in order to assure member uh, the, in order to ensure 
uh, member, family, and staff safety. Uh, however, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member, today, four months later, the trends are emerging that family and st that uh, signal abuse of this option. As infection rates stabilize and in many states fall, proxy voting is being used in increased numbers by up to 20% of all members and often inconsistently with members picking and choosing when they want to be in DC. We're also seeing increased use of proxy voting on Fridays, a sign that members are using it to take a long weekend back home. These practices show us that the use of proxy voting is no longer being utilized in the spirit in which it was implemented, safety, but rather in the spirit of convenience. Americans deserve better. They deserve their members to show up to work, and I would encourage next Congress's rules package include additional guardrails if the proxy voting remains at all. The second bucket is an, is an acknowledgement of the work of the Select Committee on Modernization of Congress, in which I and my peers passed our final report of nearly 100 recommendations last week unanimously. These recommendations emphasize the need for the House to increase transparency, streamline operations, and improve accessibility so that all our constituents can engage in the work that we do. Rules changes to require our legislative documents to be publicly shared in a machine-readable format and for all committee votes to be recorded and compiled into a publicly accessible database are concrete, realistic improvements. Similarly, making permanent some of the technological advancements we've made in facing the pandemic, such as continuing the clerk's use of the e-hopper and allowing the electronic sponsorship and co-sponsorship of bills, not only saves our staff time, but saves the taxpayers money. I would recommend we also expand electronic signatures for discharge petitions. Lastly, modernizing our institution to be accessible by those with disabilities is a duty and priority in which we are behind. We have dedicated considerable resources to making our campus physically accessible, but need to put the same emphasis on accessibility for those that interact from afar. There are many changes we need to make. Two at the top of the list are ensuring that all congressional websites are accessible to the disabled and that all video products of the House have closed captioning. I encourage you and your team to read the Select Committee's final list of recommendations for more details on each of these proposed rules changes and dozens more. The final bucket I encourage this committee to consider when crafting the rules for the 117th Congress is the need for continued modernization. As a previous staffer and now a member who has had the honor to serve on both the Committee on House Administration and this Select Committee on Modernization, I see opportunities before us to better this institution and to do it in a bipartisan manner. The efforts of the Select Committee need to continue. I know there are different ideas on what form that should take. And I'm open to the various options, including authorizing another select committee, creating a subcommittee of House administration, or a less formal structure. Most important thing is that we continue the momentum that has been created. Again, thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole for holding this hearing. A rules package not only guides us, it can push us all to be better. I applaud this committee for soliciting input from all members and look forward to continuing to work together and at this time, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. And let me just assure you that uh, we will, we do take the uh, recommendations of the Committee on Modernization seriously. Uh, we created the committee, uh, and um, and we um, and we extended it's it's uh, uh, the life of the committee because we thought that the work is important. So we will uh, we will look at those things. Some of the recommendations uh, um, are would require rules changes. Some of them uh, we don't need rules changes to do. We need to get various um, other committees to to act on them, but I uh, assure you we take it very seriously. I'm now happy to yield to Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Cole, and appreciate the opportunity uh, to present my um, proposals before the House Rules Committee uh, to my colleagues. Um, this really is a, a fantastic opportunity at the beginning and onset of the 117th Congress for us to really continue to make the entire process that, uh, that that we go through each and every day more transparent, more and more inclusive. In 2011, uh, Congress chose to surrender a great deal of its power of the purse to the executive branch. And I uh, associate myself with the remarks of uh, Leader Hoyer, uh, Whip Clyburn, Mr. Cole, and many others uh, who have testified this, this afternoon 
that it is past time that we take back the power that we surrendered. Banning congressionally directed spending and giving that power to the executive branch has made the appropriations process less accountable and more arduous. It has contributed to a lack of a, a lack of comedy and too many members feel too little direct impact in their districts and are consequently not able to be as involved in the process. I believe the ban on congressionally direct, directed spending is one of the factors that contribute to breakdowns in the process and delays that end with frantic year end negotiations and government shutdowns. And prominent leaders on both sides of the aisle in and outside of Congress have realized this. They recognize that the Constitution granted Congress the power to make important decisions about spending. John Hudak of the Brookings Institution astutely recognized that, quote, the removal of congressional earmarking does not make earmarking go away. It simply transfers that power and that practice from the legislative branch to the executive branch. It does not make sense for Congress to surrender control over federal funding to unelected bureaucrats in the, in, in the administration, and I mean any administration. Members of Congress are in the best position to know the needs of our districts and the needs of our constituents. The ban does not exist in law or in House rules, as you know, but only in practice. And it can be easily changed next Congress if there is only the political will to do so. But we need to do this, as many of my colleagues have testified, the right way. We need to add additional requirements that will ensure transparency and good governments, governance while prohibiting wasteful spending. And that will require changing the rules. So I offer the following proposals to start us off on the responsible pathway towards restoring our constitutional authority. One, pro prohibit congressionally directed spending for for-profit entities. Two, post congressionally directed spending on the committee's website, in the congressional record, in bill reports, and on members' personal websites. Three, establish an online searchable congressionally directed spending database that is publicly accessible and media friendly. Four, direct the Government Accountability Office to submit an annual audit that examines the public benefits of enacted congressionally directed spending and the efficacy of the proposed transparency and accountability measures. Six, direct inspectors general to regularly review a sample of congressionally directed spending for waste, fraud, and abuse. Seven, require that all restrictions on congressionally directed spending be enshrined in House rules and that any new disclosure requirements will apply to all legislation at all times, as has been discussed by other members this, this afternoon. Currently, many legislative vehicles are left out of the requirements, including floor and self-executing amendments, amendments between chambers, and legislation considered under suspension of the rules. With a robust congressionally directed spending platform, Congress could reassert its authority in a clean and transparent manner while allowing members to better represent and secure targeted resources for our districts. Restoring congressionally directed spending won't fix everything wrong with the appropriations process but it can go a long way towards ameliorating the difficulty we experience in negotiations over funding the government. Second, Mr. Chairman, I also want to mention my support for restoring the Select Intelligence Oversight Panel. The 9-11 Commission report included several recommendations aimed at increasing oversight of appropriations for the intelligence, intelligence community. That responsibility is really only handled by the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee right now, and that's why the House established the Select Intelligence Oversight Panel in the 110th Congress. I was proud to be a member of that panel. Unfortunately, the panel was abolished in the 112th Congress. We should consider bringing it back. Revisions to the process and structure of the committee could be made to update the panel's approach and ensure that it is able to conduct a vital oversight role. The panel studies the budget requests and provides advice and feedback to the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee to help prepare the classified annex. Now more than ever, we need additional accountability over the black budget. With an administration that continues to abuse its outlay authorities and defy the congressional intent of appropriations bills, making sure that we have this important layer of accountability and oversight in the black portion of the budget of appropriations is absolutely essential. And this panel would be useful no matter which administration is in power. It's important that Congress assert our authority over the intelligence budget and ensure that responsible funding decisions are made and made thoroughly with a lot of eyeballs. And it's just so important for us to make sure that in terms of protecting our national security, which numerous members uh, coming before the committee today have raised as being an ever increasing threat, having an oversight committee once again, that would be specifically focused on the oversight of, our, of the administration's budget request and the, the, uh, the intelligence spending that we do for our entire nation would be a critical oversight component 
that would allow us to make sure that we can continue to improve our national security. Thank you for the opportunity to present my suggestions and I yield. Thank you very much, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cole. I really appreciate you holding today's hearing to listen to concerns and proposals from your colleagues regarding the rules of the House. Uh, hearings like this are critical to the effective function of Congress, and I sincerely appreciate this opportunity to testify on practices that can improve the legislative operations of this body. Uh, many of the House rules that are in place provide the necessary transparency and accountability in the legislative process, but unfortunately, these rules are often worked around or waived when it matters most. I'm here today just to highlight practices already established that I believe we should be exercising to increase transparency and accountability. Accordingly, by following these well thought out rules, we can rein in the crippling dysfunction that has plagued the legislative process. Uh, the 72 hour rule was established so that members of Congress and the public have time to read and review legislation before having members vote on it. Unfortunately, this rule can be waived in rules committee or can be worked around by amending an existing bill, typically by an amendment in the nature of a substitute. Sadly, these occurrences are frequently used on appropriations and larger authorization measures. For example, last week, the text of the continuing resolution was introduced uh, less than an hour before members had an opportunity to vote on it. Uh, this flies in the face of responsible governance. Measures like these should not be passed under suspension of the rules. Managing it in the manner in that manner takes away any feasible transparency to the voters of where their member stands on specific spending measures. Uh, the abandonment of adhering to the spirit of the 72 hour rule has been happening well before this Congress. Admittedly, both sides of the aisle have utilized this tactic while in the majority. Uh, that's why I've introduced a House resolution uh, with one of my fellow freshmen, uh, Democrat, uh, to tighten this rule's instances where a bill is stripped of its text and replaced by new language to skirt the 72 hour rule. It's not just a matter of transparency that members should have time to read bills they'll be voting on, it's a matter of respect. Respect that all members have a right to read the legislation, not just those who are in leadership drafting it. In addition to the ability to read bills before voting on them, members should be given the opportunity to offer amendments on bills they were not able to help draft. Um, way, way back in the day, I was a staffer here on the Hill, and uh, in the 90s, we considered uh, more appropriations and larger authorization bills under open rules or modified open rules. And this allowed members who did not have an opportunity to amend bills when they were in committee, an opportunity to do so on the floor before having to vote on it. Uh, there have been no open rules on the House floor during this Congress, and the last time an open rule or revised open rule was reported out of the Rules Committee was in the 114th Congress. Many members sincerely do want to participate in the legislative process. We genuinely believe we have serious amendments to improve legislation. Uh, I have 16 years in the state legislature working with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to improve legislation throughout the process, and my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, should have the chance to improve legislation here in the Congress. Uh, the last area for improvement that I'd like to recommend today is the importance of uh, individual bill consideration when it comes to appropriations measures. And while it's not specific to this committee, this committee does have uh, great sway and influence, and I would uh, urge you to help uh, encourage regular order when it comes to appropriations bills. Each of the appropriations subcommittees work hard to produce a bill, uh, and members should be afforded the opportunity to vote on and offer amendments to individual appropriations bills. Uh, as was said earlier by my colleagues, Article 1, Section 7 of the U.S. Constitution establishes that revenue bills shall originate in the House. This is one of the most important and serious responsibilities that the House has when these bills are passed as massive packages or funding is pushed through as a continuing resolution that impacts members' ability to thoughtfully consider legislation. Uh, the American people should expect more fiscal responsibility and uh, focus from Congress instead of relegating those duties by passing expansive appropriations packages. Congressional leaders need to return to a regular order appropriations process, and the Rules Committee should encourage leaders to produce appropriations measures that are reported to the floor as their individual bills instead of as packages. Uh, these are all issues that can easily be fixed by using the existing processes and respecting the rules that are established. Uh, these changes are within our power as members to make and would establish a baseline of respect that all members deserve in this chamber. It also extends that same respect to the voters who elected each of us to thoughtfully represent them here in the House of Representatives. Thank you for the work that you do, and I look forward to working with the Rules Committee to bring about more transparency and accountability in the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Castro. Uh, thank you to Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole for holding this important hearing. 
Uh, today, I'm here to discuss a proposed change to the rules package for the next Congress that would institutionalize the Tri-Caucus Witness Diversity Initiative. As you all know, the Tri-Caucus is composed of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and the Congressional Black Caucus. This year, the Tri-Caucus launched this important initiative to track the diversity of the expert witnesses who testify before House committees. Our announcement included support from Speaker Pelosi, Majority Leader Hoyer, Whip Clyburn, the Women's Caucus, the Congresswoman Sharice Davids, co-chair of the LGBTQ plus caucus, and from Congresswoman Deb Holland, co-chair of the Native American caucus. While a witness diversity initiative has never existed as part of the core functions of the House, two parliamentary bodies in the United Kingdom are already leading this work in Westminster and in Scotland. Our tri-caucus initiative has in large part been modeled after their work to track the gender diversity of their witnesses. And while this is the first initiative of its kind here, research on this topic as it pertains to gender does exist. For example, an American University report published earlier this year shows that during the 2017 hearings on tax reform, less than 19% of the witnesses who testified were women. As you know, the 116th Congress is the, the most diverse Congress in our nation's history. Yet too often, our witnesses do not reflect the nation's diversity. Unfortunately, for many years, many communities have often been underrepresented, including Latinos, African-Americans, Asian, women, and LGBTQ folks. In this moment of national reckoning on racism in America, and as a global pandemic disproportionately harms communities of color, now is the time for change and for our rules to reflect our values. As Congress continues to draft legislation to support our country's fight against COVID-19, it's critical that members of Congress hear from diverse witnesses in that process. The institutionalization of this important initiative will make clear to the American people the House's commitment to diversity and transparency in Congress. With each Congress, we should aim to reform and improve on the ways in which we serve the American people. I believe this proposal is an important step toward a more just, a fairer, and a more inclusive Congress. And with that, I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Mr. The last on this panel, Mr. Christ. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank you and Ranking Member Cole, along with all the members of the Rules Committee. You all worked so very hard and the entire House uh, are grateful to you. Earlier this summer, Americans from big cities and small towns across our country took to the streets to peacefully protest racial injustice in the largest demonstrations in American history. Between income inequality, wealth inequality, educational achievement gaps, criminal justice inequality, discrimination in lending and appraisals, voter suppression, maternal health disparities, and armed white supremacists proudly marching through American streets, the American people said enough. Americans of all shapes, sizes, and colors said, quote, Black Lives Matter, and committed to fight racism. We committed to dismantle systems of racism that hold black Americans back instead of just going about business as usual. Being on autopilot while the American experience continues to fail our black citizens is no longer going to cut it. It's on all of us to do whatever we can to truly deliver equal opportunity and equal justice under the law. We as legislators should be aware of and intentional about the racial impact of the policies we make. That is why I'm proposing a small but potentially significant change to the rule of the House for the 117th Congress. Just as committee reports are required by House rules to include items like a Congressional Budget Office score for budgetary impact, we should also ask for a score on racial impact of legislation the House is considering. Awareness will be an important uh, tool for fighting racism however insidious or accidental in our policies. This information will help members who want to tackle racial gaps, and it will help members who at the very least don't want to make things worse. The Congressional Budget Office already has this capability and already provides this analysis upon request. 
I ask that we work together, the party of Lincoln and the party of Obama, to say that although we may fall short sometimes, we as a house are committed to try. A racial impact score won't end injustice, but it will be a good start. I thank you for your consideration and I welcome any questions about my proposal. And briefly before I yield back, Mr. Chairman, I want to associate myself with my good friend and fellow Floridian Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy for her amendment to raise a threshold for motions to recommit. Thank you again so much, and I yield the balance of my time, sir. Uh, thank you all very much for your uh, testimony, um, and um, and I would um, um, uh, and and I really have I have no questions. Um, I do just want to point out for the record, though, Mr. Davis, that. Uh, you mentioned that infection rates have been uh, uh, have been stabilized. Uh, the latest news reports show that infection rates, in fact, are going up. So uh, we are not out of the woods with regard to this uh, this terrible virus. I'm sad to say, in large part because um, we have not had a national strategy uh, to manage it uh, appropriately. But uh, in any event, uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I I, uh, I agree. There are pockets that we're, we're seeing increases. I was referring to overall in the last four months, and there are many areas that are going down. Uh, but I, I would I would urge this committee also. I, I agree with you. We haven't prepared the house either. I think we need a comprehensive plan to be able to get the house back to work and be able to begin uh, yeah. implementing yeah. some of the same measures that have helped stabilize other parts of the countries right, right on this. And, 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 I, and I think we should uh, do what we we can to better protect this chamber. But I. I also don't believe the answer is to make it uh, more challenging for members to participate during a pandemic. In fact, my, my counter argument would be that I think it's really um, sad that um, the, the minority has decided to inf enforce against its own members uh, a, a, a demand that they not participate in proxy voting, which has basically disenfranchised um, hundreds of thousands of voters. I mean, you have members, um, you know, depending on what what week it is, uh, a considerable amount of Republicans don't show up, but they can't, they, they can't vote because uh, with the exception of one, uh, your leadership says they can't. So, you know, let's, let's figure out how we go forward. I, I hope that this is not an issue um, in a few months, but that all depends on how the nation handles this. Uh, uh, I now yield to Mr. Cole for any questions he may have. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Just on that last point, uh, uh, I do want to say I do agree very much with what Mr. Davis said. There are legitimate cases uh, where people can't be here. I respect that. And uh, while I didn't agree with the methods we adopted, we adopted them. And that was done by a straight majority vote. That's fair enough. Uh, I am concerned a lot of members are abusing them. A lot of members just simply what, are not. Can you yield to me? One second. I certainly yield to my friend. Yeah, let me let me just say that if... Um that, that uh, if members are abusing this, if members are using this um, based on convenience, uh, that is certainly not uh, what I had intended. And I think that that is wrong. And, uh, you know, and I certainly, every chance I get reinforce that message. This is not about convenience. It is about necessity. Uh, yeah, and Mr. Chairman. That we, then it's, and that's unfortunate. Well, please don't uh, think that I question you at all, because no, I don't. I know. I don't. Uh, and uh, and I know you take it seriously. I know that. I just I just think it's worth thinking about what we can do on that score, because it uh, it seems like a legitimate problem to me. But I want to get back to number one. Thank the panel. A lot of really great suggestions here. A couple I don't agree with, but uh, by, broadly I do. And so I have both a couple of comments for specific members and a question. Particularly, I want to go first to uh, my good friend, my fellow appropriator, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, who uh, uh, you know, I had the pleasure when I first got on probes of being on her subcommittee that she chaired on Ledge Branch, and then later have her as my ranking member when I was fortunate enough to chair that committee. And there's just not a better appropriator. There's nobody more thoughtful from an institutional standpoint. Uh, so, number one, I want to associate myself with uh, the very thoughtful comments she had about uh, congressionally directed spending and the safeguards and the ability to evaluate the effectiveness. I think if they're ever coming back, those kind of tools are actually indispensable in uh, providing the, the public with some confidence that 
these things are being used as they are 95% of the time or more in an appropriate and productive way. Uh, but I do want to also ask my friend, uh, she talked about uh, bringing back the uh, uh, the uh, Select Committee on Intelligence. And, uh, you know, I've said on defense appropriations, we do a lot of great work there. But again, I take my friend's suggestion very seriously. Can you tell me why uh, we did away with that. What was the rationale for not continuing uh, that select committee? So when we when when it was done away with, it was done away with by the uh, the, the new Republican majority. So I, I'm not sure what their motivation was, and so I I, I can't speak for uh, you know for um, Speaker Boehner at the time. I think it was Speaker Boehner that uh, that did yeah. it. it. Um, but you know, it was it was in place and working effectively, so that we had. And if you recall, the select the, the select committee was a subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee, but it was a special su su special select subcommittee that combined in intel auth uh, intel authorizers and appropriators from across the uh, Appropriations Committee, and it was a a combined pair of more scrutinizing eyes. We, uh, we held hearings and reviewed uh, the budget, the budget requests. We, uh, we, we dove more deeply and specifically into the, into the black portion of the budget um, than the Defense Appropriations Committee is really able to do because, I mean, the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee is, has such a huge responsibility being 50% of this discretionary funding. Um, the, the, my understanding why it wasn't brought back was that it had some cumbersome elements of it that uh, that per perhaps it wasn't uh, functioning in the most efficient way. So my proposal isn't specific to replicate it and bring it back exactly the way it was, but that there does need to be a select intelligence subcommittee panel uh, recreated, perhaps you know new and improved, so that we can make sure that there are. Um, either combined authorizers and appropriate appropriator eyeballs together, or you know, maybe just appropriators, so that we can really have more attention paid. <coughs> and frankly, the defense appropriators are really able to. No, yeah, I think there's considerable merit to what you're talking about. Speaking as a defense appropriator, uh, you're exactly right. It's a vast budget, and honestly, most of the intel hearings we have, of course, they're classified, so I'm not getting into detail, but the reality is what we're doing is consuming intelligence. We're being given intelligence, but we're not overseeing the intelligence that we're being given and, and asking the tough kind of questions. So, um, you know, again, I nobody admires and loves Speaker Boehner more than me. He wasn't exactly the Appropriations Committee's biggest fan in Congress. Uh, and it's, it doesn't surprise me that we're talking about, uh, you know, congressionally directed spending and and this particular item, uh, now that he's gone, <laughs> it, uh, uh, and I, again, I say that with great affection and respect for my friend, the former speaker, uh, but uh, it's a good idea, I think, and uh, I'd really um, like to think about this, associate myself with you, because, again, I just speaking as a defense appropriator, you are exactly right. Uh, and I, we're just not able to get into the detail of this vast budget anyway you can when you're dealing with interior at 30 billion dollars it's just it's a function of the dollars and uh, i don't think you could probably have too many eyes on on this particular area and i say that with no disrespect to any administration no. frankly i think the bureaucracy needs to be watched as much as the, the administrations uh do as well so I, it's a good idea let me move now if i could to my friend mr klein uh, and just tell you, as an appropriator, I couldn't agree more, and I bet every appropriator would want each bill to come individually. That's the way we treat them in the Appropriations Committee itself. Uh, we have unlimited amendments in the Appropriations Committee. Obviously, any member, either side of the aisle, got a good idea, can offer those amendments. I long for the day when we did that uh, in the full House. Uh, I will tell you there's two problems, and uh, they're bipartisan in nature. The first one is the absolute explosion of the number of people that decide they want to to uh, add amendments to the appropriations bill. And so it gets down from a management question, how much time do you want to spend on appropriations? How much floor time do you want to give us? We're happy to take it, 
Uh, and uh, but uh, I don't know that you know, when you we have 100, 200, 300, 400 amendments, that's a problem. And how you have discipline that it's actually a problem for this committee too, the rules committee, but it's an enormous problem uh, before we took it just uh, from the management. The second thing I will tell you, and um, I will also tell you both sides were equally guilty, the number of got you amendments uh, have multiplied extraordinarily in my time here. Uh, you know, and frankly, the fear of voting on those amendments by members uh, when Republican majority came back in, one of the things it actually did do was restore open rules on appropriations bill. Uh, but we actually got to a point, I remember it was on a very well, it was on a Confederate flag issue of all things over national uh, monuments. And uh, it blew apart a bill. Uh, and uh, members were then afraid. I mean, when I originally got here, you would literally, if you were a Republican, you know, you'd vote on the amendments however you wanted, but you'd always vote for the final Republican bill. That was just kind of assumed because it was considered to be better. Democrats were the same way uh, when they were in the majority. But, uh, you know, if you've got any thoughts about, number one, how to control the number of amendments, and number two, again, you know, we have lots of Republicans, I'll just be honest with you, who won't vote for Republican appropriations bills. Because they don't want to vote for anything other than defense and veterans. Uh, and, and if you have that, you can't move the bill. Uh, and because you can't expect Democrats to do the work that a Republican majority is supposed to do. This is a real problem inside our party. They think, uh, you know, and again, I have no problem with people voting its bills if they exceed what the budget cap's done. I've never seen Republicans do that. I mean, we write the budget, we write the bills within our budget. Uh, so there's got to be, uh, again, some way of dealing with the sheer number of amendments. And and, uh, and again, I'm all for them. I like individual bills and I like open rules. Uh, so I agree with you. But uh, you got any suggestions for how we avoid got you amendments and how we say, OK, after you've had a crack at your amendment, uh, we do have to govern the country. Uh, that means the Defense Department needs to be funded. That means that health and human services need to be funded. Uh, you can't only vote for the things you like. You have responsibility to govern here. Uh, you can't expect the other party to do it when you're in the majority. That's a problem. So anyway, that's a that's a lot of rambling thought. But I'm very you're you're one of our brightest members. I'm very interested in what you have to say. Well, I appreciate the question, the opportunity to respond. I, uh, the Appropriations Committee does a great job, and I think. Uh, the answer is to get get skin in the game uh, on the parts of the various members regarding the bills to get broader support and uh, getting them to vote for amendments definitely gets their skin in the game. I would say in 16 years in the state legislature, when we had amendments that, that went on and on on the floor, we had to sit through them all. So I would say if you just asked for people to submit amendments by a date certain and then offer them on the floor in the order received and the ones and you have to sit through all the amendments before you get off of your <laughs> then you'll have a lot of people giving up on their amendments <laughs> yeah i just uh, that's a, that's actually a very clever idea i'm not sure i want to subject myself to it being a responsible <laughs> member uh there's a lot of members that offer pretty frivolous amendments and they're not confined to either side so uh but uh, interesting thought anyway uh, I, again appreciate the testimony appreciate all the testimony uh, yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. I, and I, I, when you were just making a, when you were a give and take with Mr. Klein, I was thinking of the time that Jeff Flake offered several hundred, 500, 500 amendments, um, all, you know, on an appropriation bill, all reducing the amount by like a, 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 a small amount. Um, and, uh, I mean, uh, but, you know, that's the, uh, anyway. Mr. Chairman, that's when you penalize him by putting him on appropriations. Yeah. No, I, I, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, can I respond to that? They tried that. It didn't work. We even move Labor H out of the subcommittee because we had two members that wouldn't vote to move a bill out of subcommittee that cut the top line by 14%. Because it wasn't enough. So, uh, yeah, please just send us real appropriators, Democrat or Republican alike, not people that you think will learn there, what people that want to be there.
like my friend, Miss Wasserman Schultz, and I'm sure you would be a great appropriator if you chose to be. Thank you. Uh, let me see what they do. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Perlman. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And just on that last subject, uh, Mr. Klein, I remember uh, on the Rules Committee, we were doing appropriations by an open rule. Our chair at that time was a guy named Dave Obie. And he had been going for 24 hours straight uh, because so many amendments had been offered. And he finally, I don't know, Mr. McGovern, if you remember this, I but he, he always had about five pencils in his pocket and he'd broken them all. He was so mad and he came to us and he said, I quit unless you guys go back up and limit this appropriations. He said, I'll do a hundred amendments. That's it. And we had to uh, leave the floor and go back and change the rule because he it's felt like it had been a filibuster. He make felt like it, make him make him sleep there. <laughs> well, he felt like he was being punished and he didn't deserve to be punished. And right. he, was, he said it and we agreed. So I just there has been some real abuse of this. And and so I'd, I'd like to change it. Just I want you to know that. And that's why there has been limitation. And Mr. Coles recognized that we recognized it. Uh, you may have some points as to a limiting factor. You got to have your amendments in so many days in advance. You got to sit there through all of it. And that may make it a, a better approach and people feel that they're more involved. But I can tell you there has been uh, real abuse uh, on that process. I agree. And, I, and I appreciate that. And I've combined the talking about the two issues uh, in my testimony, but the, the open rules apply to non-appropriations bills as well. And I think uh, a more open process would put more skin in the game on the part of members and get them supporting the bills on final passage. You, we have Jefferson's rules in Virginia where if you contribute to the product, you are bound to vote for the product. Well, and that's another issue here because you could get an amendment and still vote against the bill. And that's been, you know, something else that we uh, watch closely. And But I, I hear you and I recognize uh, what you're suggesting. I did want to respond to to the chairman and Mr. Davis and Mr. Cole, and then sort of in advance to my friend, Mr. Morelli, because I, um, I'm i a little bit in disagreement with all of you on the um, proxy voting piece of this thing. The, the way the rule was written, and I have it in front of me, is that proxies are only available during a covered period. And the covered period is defined very specifically as a period where there has been a pandemic declared and the sergeant at arms and the house physician have to uh, advise the speaker who then says this uh, period is uh, this covered period will now last for 45 days. So you're you're in a very restrictive time to be able to use a proxy. So this isn't a proxy that we would have, um, you know, when it's sunny and warm and everybody's healthy and there's no pandemic. Now, we may want to actually offer proxies or some virtual voting, but that's not the system that we created, and it is very restrictive. And there isn't uh, Mr. Davis, and I know Mr. Morelli had the same concerns, uh, but there isn't a call for a doctor's note to be able to say, I get to, to do proxy voting. That's not is what is required. What is required is a declaration of a pandemic, which in my opinion is far more restrictive. So uh, I just wanted to, to say that, but I do believe, and I would say to the chair and to Mr. Cole, we really do have to look closely again at what we did uh, sort of in an emergency measure with respect to proxies, with respect to virtual voting, and with respect to that whole rule 25, which is the uh, rule on the continuity of government in the event of a catastrophe and how we, continue the legislature in place. So uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm for the congressional, uh, congressionally directed uh, spending, but I do think uh, our committee has to take a good look at, uh, I guess it's rule 20, it's, the, it's when we have a quorum, but it's really the catastrophe of an attack 
or a pandemic. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In true rules committee fashion, we've outlasted many of our witnesses. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, Mr. Castro's uh, testimony on, on diversity during uh, testimony, which I think is incredibly uh, important, uh, probably more so now that I'm in the minority than when I was in the uh, in the majority. But I, as we talk about uh, faith and trust in institutions, uh, the majority has the privilege of setting the agenda. Uh, but uh, when we have these panels that include five majority witnesses and one minority witness, uh, it does appear that we're preparing for a press release more than we're preparing for for shedding light on on difficult and and uh, partnered uh, partnered subjects. So I would not only like to see the the metrics that Mr. Castro was uh, has been uh, focused on, but also uh, that uh, that diversity of ideas uh, uh, as we enter eras uh, where I hope we all have fewer Republican ideas versus democratic ideas and just more good ideas versus bad ideas. Uh, I think there's a, an opportunity for that. Uh, I wanted to find out from Mr. Klein, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, open rule I got to be a part of was in 2011. Uh, we took up the entire appropriations uh, package at once, the entire omnibus appropriations bill. Uh, we went uh, from Tuesday to Saturday morning, so uh, five days, uh, 24 hours uh, a day. Uh, and uh, considered every amendment that any member had to offer on anything in the entire 12 appropriations bill uh, package. Uh, exhaustion, as you suggested, uh, ultimately won the, uh, won the day. But you know, we will now have more amendments offered under a structured rule from the Rules Committee than were offered under an open rule in the late 1980s. So there is a, a, a habit that has been formed, uh, both as Mr. Cole suggested, that members are offering frivolous amendments that are designed to take down bills instead of build up bills, um, and leads to a reluctance to vote on tough amendments because we don't have any experience voting on tough amendments. The leadership sorts all those out ahead of time so that members can be more comfortable on the floor. But secondarily, we've lost those relationships with our committees. Uh, as a young freshman member, uh, I don't need to offer my amendment on the floor of the House. I need to take it to the chairman uh, two weeks before the committee get, uh, bill gets marked up so that I get it included in the base text and so that it will survive conference down the, down the road. Uh, as you have struggled with these issues, have you seen any steps to get members back uh, in a good habit? Because I fear if we flip the switch tomorrow and made things the way you and I would like for them to, to be, we would encounter the exact same comfortable situations that have brought leaders on both sides of the aisle to shut the process down. Well, I appreciate the question. And, and you all, with respect, have been here a lot longer than I have. Um, from my experience, um, there, there at the state level, for example, there's a lot more contact between the chairman and the ranking member uh, as bills are constructed. Um, so maybe the ranking member does go to his members on his committee and say, uh, the chairman has or may uh, ultimately refuse to acknowledge that, but. The, if, if earlier input is solicited from both sides and they feel invested in the product as it comes out of committee, the less likely you get these efforts to come up the process just for the sake of gumming up the process. Uh, there may be a legitimate issue as a bill goes to the floor, but as, as a freshman, I feel like my opportunity to weigh in is a committee, especially on issues of, of jurisdiction, uh, important, which I serve on, uh, not floor to a bill where I didn't see it come through committee and I don't have any, you know, maybe I have a good idea, but I should have weighed in at the committee level um, to, to make that point. The, I was a big fan of open rules when I arrived uh, here and having watched that broken process continue, I now see the wisdom of providing some structure, uh, even if it is giving the, as we have done many times, giving the chairman uh, and the ranking member on the floor the ability to consider 30 extraneous measures of their uh, of their choice, uh, providing some uh, some parameters. But uh, excuse I always hear is we don't have enough floor time. 
and as you and I uh, both know, we we uh, we start uh, sometimes fairly uh, late and end sometimes fairly early. I believe we can make time on the floor. Uh, we might not have enough pencils for David Obi uh, uh, on the floor because the chairman and the ranking member do bear the brunt of that uh, of that workload when it uh, when it happens. But, I, it, I think we would be derelict not to try to move back in that direction. I don't think there's any member of this chamber that believes shutting their colleagues down uh, leads to a better work product than including their colleagues uh, in it. And so I, I appreciate the, those suggestions. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And Mr. Chairman, I would just say if you had one open rule on any it doesn't have to be an approach bill each year, you kind of learn the lessons and the freshmen get to learn the lessons over again. Uh, of why you don't necessarily have open rules on every bill and why structured rules have benefits. Well, I, I, okay, I appreciate that. Um, but I think I, 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 the problem we have is, 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 is deeper than just a open rule versus a non-open rule. The, the, we do have a problem, and I, I think it's fair to say that there are members on both sides who uh, you know, uh, look at their role very differently. Um, and so, uh, and the other problem, quite frankly, with appropriations bills um, is we can do everything perfectly here, uh, but if you do not have a product in the Senate, um, you're, you're back to well, we don't want to be of these made big omnibus bills because otherwise there's no way to move forward. And, um, and so I, you know, we resolve uh, that problem in the short term, but- uh, I share that frustration. So anyway, but thank you. Um, I now yield to, uh, I don't know if Mr. Morelli has any questions. Uh, just a, a couple of questions or maybe just thoughts. Um, I, I, first of all, don't feel uh, that I know enough about the appropriations process or even frankly lawmaking yet here. I'm trying to unlearn everything I learned in New York for uh, decades, but I do think the problems in any legislature have been well articulated, which is this balance between trying to allow as much participation and many good ideas from members, but also to your point, Mr. Chair, you actually have to enact laws, you have to pass bills, and you've only got so much time here to do it, and we've got some big issues. So I, I'd be delighted to work with all my colleagues and Mr. Klein uh, in, in trying to figure out how to balance better perhaps those interests and, and end up with hopefully better product. I wasn't going to mention it, but since Mr. Perlmutter uttered my name, uh, I would say this, um, as it relates to proxies, I think two conditions ought to be met. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter rightly points out that when we created the rule around this pandemic, uh, one condition had to be met, and that is you essentially had this national emergency, which we recognize would make it very difficult for members to be here physically in Washington voting, but we did not want to disenfranchise them or more importantly, uh, their constituents. But I actually think if we were to pursue a, either a temporary or permanent rule in the 117th Congress, that two conditions ought to be met. The first is that the national emergency that declares there to be a covered period has to be met, and that would be uh, the same individuals who need to confer to declare a national emergency uh, that we did in the in the 116th rules, um, even if it's not COVID-19, if it's a future uh, disaster of some kind. But I also think a second condition, and that is the failure to appear to vote in person and to use the proxy ought to be by virtue of your inability to be here because of the national emergency. And I think <clears throat> my um, my uh, concern, which I expressed, I think, when we were first talking about this and, and when we implemented the rule, which I, I voted for, um, but some concern that we could be down a slippery slope. And I don't think simply meeting the first test is enough. I think, you know, I could have said, for instance, gee, I don't want to fly. It's an hour flight from Rochester, but the drive is six and a half hours each way. Yet since the beginning of March, I've driven virtually every week with one exception. Um, so I spend 13 hours in a car to come down and back. That is, in my mind, an inconvenience. I suppose I could say, well, it's a covered period. Excuse me. It's a covered period. I don't want to spend 13 hours in a car to come down and, and vote uh, for a few days and go back. But to me, that's an inconvenience that there's not a reason because of the covered emergency, which which would prohibit me or prevent me from being here. And I think that ought to be the second condition or test that needs to be met when we go will to the uh, general yield. Will the general yield to me for one second? Yes, of course, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. yeah. So right now, I mean, if you want to 
vote by proxy, you have to sign a letter uh, that says that you um, you cannot physically be here due to the pandemic. Uh, now, I mean, that's the requirement. Uh, we have that requirement. Uh, but I don't think it's in the rule. And, and frankly, I'm not sure. Well, I, uh, you know, I would always defer to the chair. I, I, well, no, think... I, mean, but, but, I mean, the deal is, you know, we're trusting members to abide by, you know, um, you know, by the regulations that we have uh, put out there. And so I, you know, I, uh, but I, I think but I would... the point is well taken that if there are people who are doing this simply out of convenience, that's not, that is not appropriate. Um, right. And, uh, and again, um, you know, I, and I think that that's something um, that we need to think about. So, but thank yeah, you. And I would, yeah, and I would simply just say tightening it up perhaps or putting it in the actual rule. But, and by the way, I think by and large, this has been used very effectively. And I think people have been very, very uh, good about uh, observing not only of the letter, but the spirit of the rule, and I uh, hope that would continue and and maybe some small adjustment um, to help ensure that would uh, make our our uh, friends on the other side of the aisle more comfortable. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, I uh, yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Shalala. No questions. Thank you. I've enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. I, 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 did I miss yeah, anybody? Yeah. I didn't. Uh... Mr. Chair, I did have one question for Mr. Chris. Could I ask that question? You may. Um, uh, Mr. Chris, I, I'm trying to figure out in the racial, racial and ethnic impact score, what is it that you're actually, is there something like that that exists today, not so much in the Congress, but maybe Florida does something like that or some someplace? I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out what it looks like. You're you're muted, Charlie. You're still muted. We can't hear you. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand that it does exist in the Congress presently, uh, if requested, um, and this would make it uh, more of a mandatory thing, so that you know any legislation that we would put forward. Uh, it would give us an idea about whether or not uh, the legislation is going to uh, be um, disadvantageous, if you will, uh, to a minority uh, or not. Okay. All right. Thank you. I yield yeah. back. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, no other questions. This panel is dismissed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. We'll go to our next panel, which is Mr. Kilmer. Ms. Murphy, uh, Mr. Uh, Davids, no, I'm sorry, Ms. Davids, um, um, Mr. Taylor, and Mr. Woodall. And we'll be, uh, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Kilmer. And um, let me, let me just say, uh, yeah, let me just say before I, I yield to Mr. Kilmer, um, I want to thank uh, Chairman Kilmer and Vice Chair Graves um, in particular. I want to thank, uh, I, I want to take a moment to congratulate uh, both of you on, um, on an incredibly successful Congress. I mean, under your leadership, the Select Committee on Modernization did important work on, of analyzing how Congress could work more effectively and efficiently on behalf of the American people and identifying specific recommendations somewhere, I think, near 100, I believe, to do just that. Um, a feat unto itself. Your staff must be exhausted. But Mr. Chairman, you and, and Vice Chair Graves went even further and pushed the committee's recommendations into results. As of all our, all, all our colleagues will recall, this select committee ushered in two critical resolutions with the help of the House Administration Committee. While we may not have known, when we may not have known at the time, the select committee's recommendations to improve House technology systems, enhance and unify telework practices, and just generally push the house into the 21st century, help pave the way for key technology changes that were critical to ensuring that the house could work and do it safely in the wake of this terrible pandemic. And you did it all while having to endure uh, Nickelback, whatever that is, uh, and and Woodall, who I we all know so well. Uh, but uh, we will have more time. Uh, for this in the coming weeks, but uh, to Mr. Woodall and Mr. Graves, uh, thank you both 
for your service for your nation. I know uh, Chairman Kilmer and Ms. Scanlon, our rules colleague, and, and the rest of the modernization committee. I hope that you're all proud of the work that you've done, and I think it's had a lasting impact. Uh, and uh, we thank the hardworking staff of the modernization committee. Uh, I think you've improved this institution, and so I'm grateful for your leadership. And anyway, I just wanted to say it because I think a lot of people may not appreciate uh, the extent of your work and how hard you worked and the fact that, you know, this is the way this place should work, where Democrats and Republicans come together and try to, you know, do things for the good of the institution. So let me uh, thank you, and I will now yield to Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, uh, and thank you for your kind words, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member Cole. I appreciate you hosting uh, the Member Day hearing, and I appreciate the opportunity to share with you some ideas for improving the House rules for the 117th Congress. Two years ago, uh, in testimony before this committee, I proposed as part of the House rules for the 116th Congress, a committee to consider measures to improve the operation of Congress and an independent, as an independent and co-equal branch of government. And under your leadership, the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress was created as part of the rules package for the 116th. Uh, as chair of the Select Committee, I'm here to um, say thank you for your guidance and support over the past two years. I'm very grateful to you and to your staff. I, and with that help, the Select Committee unanimously passed 97 bipartisan recommendations to make Congress work better for the American people. And I'm proud of what we achieved and I'm grateful for the opportunity to lead the effort along with Vice Chair Tom Graves and in partnership with Mr. Woodall and Ms. Scanlon from your committee um, who served very ably. I'm also here to share with you some of the bipartisan recommendations the Select Committee recently passed that would improve the way the House functions. The Select Committee spent a lot of time focusing on ways to reclaim Congress's Article I powers and made a number of strong recommendations in that space. And the first proposal I'd like to highlight will help restore Congress's Article I power of the purse. We recommended on a bipartisan basis a community-focused grant program to reduce dysfunction in the annual budgeting process and to restore Congress's unique constitutional authority to appropriate federal dollars to support projects that have the broad support of local communities across the United States. This competitive grant program calls for transparency and accountability and supports meaningful and transformative investments in the communities we represent. Taxpayer dollars will be spent more efficiently and transparently on local projects with guardrails against abuse. And the Select Committee believes that this program could help end the era of government shutdowns, and I urge the committee to include it as part of the 117th uh, Congress's rules package. In addition to the community-focused grant program, I'd like to share a couple of ideas designed to strengthen Car Congress's Article I powers. The first has to do with encouraging the Article I principle of debate and deliberation. The Select Committee recommended establishing a pilot for weekly Oxford-style policy debates on the House floor. Debate exposes us to perspectives that are different from our own and requires us to really think through our positions in order to build the best arguments we can. It requires the ability to listen as well as speak, and that's incredibly important. My Select Committee colleague, Emmanuel Cleaver, constantly reminded us that how we treat each other matters. And these Oxford style debates could showcase passionate but civil exchanges about the issues of the day, and we should encourage more of that. Along the same lines, the Select Committee recommended that committees experiment with alternative hearing formats to encourage more bipartisan discussion. Committees should try questioning witnesses in ways that encourage discourse rather than grandstanding. I also recommend that more committees follow the Select Committee's lead and experiment with mixed seating arrangements where Democrats and Republicans sit side by side rather than on opposite sides of the dais. These simple experiments encourage dialogue and stability and ultimately strengthen Congress. Including these ideas in the next House Rules Package would help Congress restore Article I capacity. Another way to build capacity is to build efficiency into the congressional schedule. Between committee work, floor work, running a personal office, and constituent work in the district, the demand for time is constant. So the Select Committee tried to find ways to reduce frustrating conflicts. We focused on committee work and recommend that the House establish specific committee-only meeting times when Congress is in session. We also recommended that the House establish specific days or weeks where committee work takes priority. Creating a common committee calendar portal to help with scheduling could also reduce conflicts. These ideas will make Congress work more efficiently and productively on behalf of the American people. Finally, I'd like to thank you for your continued attention to a number of operational issues the Select Committee has recommended. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we recommended that the House update its procedures to allow members to electronically add or remove their names as bill co-sponsors. 
We're happy to see this now in effect and think it should be permanently authorized. Same goes for our recommendations to expand the use of digital signatures and make permanent the option to electronically submit committee reports. We should adopt procedures that make Congress more efficient rather than reserve them for emergencies. The COVID-19 pandemic has for forced us to take a hard look at continuity issues and think about how we can better prepare for the unexpected. The select committee uh, recommends that committees establish bipartisan telework policies and update systems to encourage in-person electronic voting and other modern technologies. Cybersecurity telework and emergency preparedness training should also be given to all members of Congress. By taking these steps, we can ensure that Congress is fully prepared in the event of another crisis. Continu continuity of government plans should be built into our procedures and happen as a matter of course. From day one, the Select Committee's guiding principle has been to make Congress work better so that we can better serve the American people. That simple but profound goal has guided all of our work, some of which I've shared with you today. Vice Chair Graves and I believe the bipartisan ideas that we propose to improve the House rules can help build capacity and ultimately strengthen Congress, and we hope they will be implemented. For that matter, our committee, committee generally agreed that the work to modernize and improve the People's House should be an ongoing effort, not once every 20 or 30 years or so. And so I'd encourage this committee to consider how, if at all, to ensure that work of improvement continues going forward. On behalf of the select committee, I appreciate your consideration. Happy to provide additional information to support your work. And thank you again for your leadership partnership and for the opportunity to speak before the committee today. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Murphy. Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and the members of the committee, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify about my views on the rules that will govern the operation of this chamber in the next Congress. So my first set of recommendations involve fiscal discipline and transparency. First, I respectfully request that we retain the PAGO rule in Rule 21, Clause 10 of the current House Rules. This rule was also in effect for the 110th and the 111th Congresses when Democrats were in the majority. In general, it prohibits the consideration of direct spending or re revenue legislation that is projected to increase the deficit over two discrete time periods. Second, I would recommend that we strengthen the transparency around this rule. If the Rules Committee reports a special rule providing for a consideration of a bill, the company committee report should be required to include a specific statement indicating whether the special rule waives the PAGO, PAGO rule in particular, as opposed to a vague statement waiving all points of order against the bill. This can be accomplished by amending Rule 13, Clause 3, and my office is preparing draft language and will share it with your staff. Third, I'd like to work with the committee on crafting a carefully calibrated amendment to the House rules that would accept an exigent uh, circumstances prohibit the House from considering a bill unless CBO and JCT have prepared and published a cost estimate of that bill. I seek these three changes for a simple reason. You know, contrary to wishful thinking in some quarters, um, deficits and debt do matter. They matter to our economy, they matter to our security, and to our children and grandchildren's future. And I recognize that deficit spending to combat the health and economic consequences of COVID-19 is necessary. And I support that spending. But Congress will need to bring spending and revenues into better balance once the pandemic is behind us. And we shouldn't keep digging ourselves into a deeper fiscal hole. And if we do, we better be upfront with the American people about it. Um, my second set of recommendations re involves a motion to recommit provided for in Rule 19. Unlike some of my colleagues, I do not believe we should eliminate the MTR, which I view as an important tool for the minority party in an otherwise majoritarian institution. At the same time, I recognize that the MTR is frequently used by the minority party to engage in um, you know, cynical politics, campaigning on the House floor, uh, rather than as a part of a genuine effort to improve a bill. The text of the MTR doesn't um, does not undergo uh, uh, committee review or otherwise get vetted through regular order. And so it's often poorly written and confusing, and members rarely have the sufficient time to review the language and to determine what it actually does, as opposed to what the minority party claims it does. And I think this is a recipe for bad legislating. So for those reasons, I believe we should retain the MTR, but require two thirds support for the MTR to pass rather than the current requirement, uh, requirement of majority support. This would put the MTR on the same plane as a suspension bill. 
Finally, I recommend that we continue to find new ways to foster bipartisanship in the House by facilitating floor consideration of bills that have a critical mass of bipartisan co-sponsors. At the urging of myself and other members, the House established the consensus calendar in Rule 15, Clause 7 of the current rules. And I'm deeply grateful to you uh, and your staff for helping make that happen. Um, in the coming weeks, my office will propose specific ways to strengthen the consensus calendar and to otherwise promote bipartisan cooperation during these otherwise highly partisan times. I think the American people want their representatives to work across party lines and um, House rules should reward lawmakers who conduct themselves in that spirit. With that, thank you, and I yield back. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I should just point out for the record, though, um, uh, that uh, in the current rules committee reports, we don't just say waive all points of order. Um, we actually, in the in the section on ex ex explanation of waivers, um, it, 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 if we waive PAYGO, it, it, it's specifically says, you know, uh, in our report that we waive clause 10 of rule uh, 21, which is which is the PAYGO provision. So the rules committee report is pretty explicit um, about um, waiving PAYGO or, or not waiving PAYGO, whatever. So I just, I, it, it is it is there. Um, uh, but in any event, uh, uh, thank you. I now I turn to Ms. Davids. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Chairman McGovern and uh, Ranking Member Cole for holding this hearing and allowing uh, us the opportunity to comment on uh, proposed House rule changes for the 117th Congress. Uh, so my recommendation for a rule change is pretty straightforward. I propose that the director of the Congressional Budget Office be invited to provide an address or report to Congress on the fiscal state of the nation each year. And, you know, while right now uh, we are in a crisis which necessitates spending to keep our economy going, uh, our federal budget is on an unsustainable trajectory. And I believe this is the sort of report that could provide a common uh, baseline for my colleagues and I to work from uh, using the same data and operating under the same budgetary assumptions year to year. Uh, you know, the, as this body formulates budgets, and votes on appropriations packages each year it would be helpful to have the general input and objective position have that general input uh, of an uh, objective position so that we can set goals based on uh, based on facts and i also think this sort of annual report uh, could help remind our colleagues of the very real effects of congressional spending and perhaps facilitate a conversation on how we could direct federal resources in a responsible way and uh, of course uh, we we should be uh, adhering to the uh, existing House rules, uh, the pay as you go, which we were just talking about or hearing about uh, rule, which requires Congress to pay for legislation we're proposing and voting on. Um, you know, budgeting is about priorities and deciding what's important and what price we're willing to pay for it. And that principle is at the fundamental core of PAYGO, which is uh, why I support its inclusion um, and its continued inclusion in the House rules uh, for this Congress and the next Congress. <clears throat> We've seen the disastrous consequences of fiscal irresponsibility with uh, deficit finance tax cuts for the wealthy and out of control budgets. And uh, it, it is worth noting and we, we've already heard this, but um, I'll reiterate that we are, we're going through a pandemic right now and this uh, the spending that we're doing and the relief that people need is very real and necessary. And uh, this is the kind of crisis where PAYGO rules might need to be waived. This is a, a good example of that. Uh, when we're in a crisis, uh, we need to make sure that the people of this country are being cared for. And uh, it's also times like these that uh, we see a real demonstration of the necessity for greater fiscal responsibility in normal times. Uh, in times that are good. And so uh, we are setting ourselves up to go through times like this. So I would encourage uh, the adoption of this rule change and, uh, and any other changes that would help promote the adherence to fiscal responsibility as we aim to use our, our taxpayer resources in the most effective way possible. And with that, I will uh, yield back. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Mr. Taylor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. 
Great. Okay. Well, it's great to be with you and the ranking member and all the members of the rules committee. Uh, and uh, I just want to say that I'm a I'm a big believer in rules and process, and uh, and 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 the process that we have, I think, is really important. Um, and so, one statistic that kind of strikes me is in the hundredth Congress, uh, which is when I was in high school, uh, uh, in 1987, 88, eight uh, percent of every bill of all bills that were filed uh, actually became law. Uh, and now, in this Congress, we're at about one percent, and that's because. We're filing about fifty percent more bills, but we're passing many fewer bills. Uh, so the so the so the the percent the percentage of success has dropped, as well as the the uh, as well as the number of bills that are being filed has gone up. Uh, and so I I'm concerned that the ability for members to what I say play small ball to do small common sense pieces of legislation and get those all the way through the president's desk are, are have been impaired. So I want to offer three solutions, and I have. Talk to uh, you, to uh, to some of the rules committee staff about this, and this has been a discussion within the problem solver caucus. Uh, the first one is to build on the 290 rule uh, that was successfully implemented in the last Congress, uh, and that is to have 290 to, to apply that same rule to Senate bills. Uh, so most legislative chambers uh, in this country, in the other state legislators. Uh, have a provision that allows uh, House members to support Senate bills, Senate bills for the president, uh, to support House bills. And so that, that, so you would have to create that mechanism in order to do 290 for Senate bills, it would allow members to not only, not only to advocate for a bill and to take credit for it, uh, but also for members to then in turn be able to take uh, that to get behind a Senate bill uh, and then actually uh, compel it to get on the floor and get on the consensus calendar and really expand what I think has been a big success. And your staff has been very complimentary of, of, of the problem solvers success in getting the 290 rule uh, into, into effect and, and seeing it uh, work. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, is, is what I call four fifths, two thirds. And that is again, allowing bills that are, that are modest in intent and then are, are singular in focus uh, to, to, to be able to come to the floor of the U.S. House. And so, this would be if a bill gets four fifths of the committee members to sign on to the bill. So it's 80% of the committee members. So in the financial services committee, there's 60 members. So you're getting, getting 50 members. Uh, you would then in turn be able to actually bring that bill uh, to the floor of the US House. And then it would basically be a suspension bill. You'd have to get two thirds vote. I put it on the consensus calendar. Um, and we could have discussions about, about some of the details of that. But again, you're trying to allow a bill that is, uh, and it'll be, you'd have to get four fifths of the committee of jurisdiction. And there are some bills uh, that are big and complicated that can refer to many, uh, many committees of jurisdiction. Uh, and I think we probably have to have some mechanism to allow uh, committee chairs, if they wanted to, to waive it, or if they not, didn't want to say, no, I want four fifths of my committee, then they would have that power. Um, and then finally, the third, third, um, ideas is trying to make sure that bills, again, that are common sense, where they pass the House and the Senate actually go to the president's desk. And if you believe it, uh, most Congresses, there are half a dozen bills that pass the House, pass the Senate, their companion legislation, but actually don't get to the president's desk. And so what about a half a dozen state legislators have done is they have a, a rule process called over and eligible, where they take, they, they'll take the, uh, this, this is a very difficult one to explain, it's very simple in, pra in practice, but basically, if, if you have a Senate bill that comes over, it's in the House, the House companion has passed committee and it's now on the floor, the House author of the House bill can say, you know what, I'm going to take my bill, set it on the table, I'm going to pull the Senate bill, which is here, it's passed, it's in this chamber, it's down at the well, I'm going to pull that up, and so now we're going to vote on the Senate bill. So it's a way to expedite the Senate bill. Some state legislatures actually have it automatic. So wherever, when the Senate bill comes over to the House, it's automatically moved to whatever point in the process that it was in. So again, this doesn't take any, any, no one loses any power per se. Uh, and one of the ideas that I have is to protect uh, the House member, the author of the bill to say, you know what, I wanna use the Senate bill and move this on so it goes on to the president's desk. And again, there's a small number of bills every Congress. Um, this, and one of the things this will do is we'll actually encourage members to do more to work on companion legislation uh, so that in turn, it'll improve the probability. Uh, I have actually talked to uh, a member of the Senate about about having a similar bill, an over an eligible rule over on the Senate side. So, hey, we're doing this to help expedite your bills. You should do this to expedite our bills. Um, and I've gotten a favorable response from Republicans and Democrats that I've spoken to uh, about all of these rules uh, as I've discussed it with my colleagues in the Problem Solver Caucus. Um, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Woodall. The, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know ours is uh, is not uh, supposed to be based uh, solely on competition in our business, but uh, I just think it's worth pointing out that while serving under your leadership here on the Rules Committee, uh, I have voted 100% uh, of the time uh, against uh, Ms. Scanlon and her against me while serving under Chairman Kilmer's leadership on the Select Committee. Uh, Ms. Scanlon and I voted 100% of the time together. And so I don't know if there's anything that Mr. Kilmer has to add that he wasn't comfortable sharing an open session about how you might bring people together here on the on the rules committee as he's been bringing people together on the joint select committee. But I, I did want to put that uh, out there uh, and uh, uh, tell him how much I appreciated his uh, leadership. I, I will tell you, Mr. Chairman, I think we were disadvantaged by not having uh, Ms. Davids and Ms. Murphy uh, on our uh, on our committee. I, I support uh, both of their uh, ideas and they sounded very similar to some of the ideas that that uh, you and I and the committee had worked on uh, throughout the, the year. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my uh, amendment uh, is to some of the good work that you did uh, at the very beginning of this Congress uh, by uh, requiring that uh, bills uh, be uh, reported out of the uh, uh, committee uh, before they are considered uh, here in the Rules Committee. And I would uh, go one step further, add a section three uh, to uh, uh, paragraph three to the section uh, 103I uh, that was uh, passed at HRS 6. It says it shall not be in order to consider a rule or order that waives the application of paragraph one after the bill or joint resolution has been referred to committee for 15 legislative uh, days. Um, uh, the, the point of this uh, change, Mr. Chairman, is to say that we, we have found uh, reasons, and there are always reasons, uh, to waive the rules including brand new rules that were, were done with the best of intentions as this one that, that you promulgated. If a bill has been sitting in committee for 15 days, clearly there's not an emergency uh, that uh, requires that it move forward without a hearing. If it's just been sitting in committee and no one has been acting on it, surely uh, it doesn't need to be rushed to, to the floor uh, with no input from the committee whatsoever. I recognize that uh, no matter who's in the majority, we have emergency uh, measures, and in fact, uh, the rule as it exists today uh, makes an exception uh, for emergency designated legislation. Uh, but this would further the building of trust in the committee process that you began uh, by saying we're not going to use this process to short circuit a committee process. We're only going to use it uh, to uh, expedite uh, things that are simply coming so quickly, they haven't had an opportunity uh, to be uh, dropped in committee and the chairman hasn't had an opportunity to have the hearing or the markup. But making the point that the reason we don't follow your rule isn't because we don't want to, it's because we haven't had an opportunity to. If the opportunity is presented, then we need to be able to say yes to that opportunity as as your rule uh, 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 was designed to achieve. Um, it uh, uh, requires that, uh, that the, the point of order uh, under this uh, uh, paragraph uh, be uh, that the question of consideration shall be debatable for 10 minutes and the member initiating the point of order uh, and, a, and an opponent uh, to have that uh, time. Uh, but shall otherwise be decided without intervening motion, uh, except for one that the House uh, adjourn. And again, I, 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 this is not intended uh, to uh, disadvantage the majority, which is in charge of, of running this institution. And it is uh, only intended to, to uh, uh, complement the effort uh, that the uh, Rules Committee Chairman made at the beginning of this Congress. With that, I yield back. Um, I think that's uh, that that that's this. Uh, I think that you're the last person on this panel, Mr. Woodall. So let me let me just say that this. Um, I appreciate your uh, your your words, Mr. Woodall. Trying to uh, uh, you know, with regard to the the, uh, the McGovern rule. Let me just say, but before that, there was no such rule. Uh, no, there was nothing in place, and um, and I said when we were doing this that we would try, you know, to. Do as well as we can, but it, it wouldn't be perfect because there would be times when it would be difficult to do that. Um, I think we were much better at it last year than than this year, but this year, to be fair, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and there's a lot of things that aren't 
normal, right? I mean, so uh, so I uh, so we, we will continue to try to do better. Um, I really do believe in principle that it's a mistake to short circuit the committee process, uh, but I think we have been making uh, a concerted effort and a fairly effective effort in trying to comply with that. Um, and um, and again, I in in my perfect world. Um, you know, that's the way this place should run. I mean, there should be hearings uh, and a markup and committee before it comes to the rules committee. Um, and then we can, you know, bring a bill to the floor. So um, I will try to do better. Um, anyway, having said that, uh, I think there's some really good ideas uh, that have been presented here today. And, um, you know, we will um, obviously be working with um, uh, the members who are here today and their staffs to try to figure out how we can move forward on some of these. And again, and maybe there may be some, you know, we might do some tweaks here and there, but um, but uh, but I really appreciate your time. Let me yield to Mr. Uh, Cole. Oh, oh uh, wait, wait, wait. oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I missed, let, me, let me yield to Mr. Woodall for any questions. Maybe you might want to question yourself. The, I do, Mr. Chairman. I've been conflicted about several things. I'm hoping we're going to be able to sort those out uh, together right uh, right here. Uh, I, the, the only other thing I wanted to mention, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is uh, uh, whether or not uh, there is a, uh, a, a process related to attaching uh, unrelated legislation to a message between the chambers. Uh, without bipartisan concurrence, that's something you and I have talked about in in rules committee uh, uh, on on many occasions, and I have tried to to work out some language, but it 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 does have to be incredibly nuanced to to protect the ability of the majority leader to uh, to continue to uh, to operate the floor while still protecting uh, minority uh, uh, rights. Uh, I appreciated uh, Ms. David's. Uh, 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 I believe it was Ms. David's uh, mentioning the motion to uh, to recommit in the nature of the uh, was it you, Ms. Murphy? Uh, uh, the the nature of the uh, motion to recommit as being that one uh, opportunity that the minority uh, has, um, as you recall from the media articles, when uh, the majority leader decided he was going to start uh, attaching unrelated uh, legislation uh, as messages uh, between the chambers. Uh, folks uh, celebrated that as being this wonderful new procedural tool that has been crafted uh, to prevent the minority uh, from getting in the way of of uh, of uh, with their with their messaging uh, motions uh, to recommit. Uh, again, I recognize the 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 need. Uh, to uh, attach uh, legislation, and I recognize the need for the the desire for the expedited process between the uh, between the chambers. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to craft something that was so restrictive the majority uh, could not uh, could not uh, assert its agenda. Uh, but I do think uh, because there has been so much uh, consternation about that process throughout the year, whether it's celebrating on one side or or bemoaning on the other, that it's worth looking at uh, these habits that we get into, not passing appropriations bills individually, not having uh, open rules, not sending things through committee. Uh, again, you took major steps at the beginning of this Congress to try to get us out of some of those bad habits that we'd spent a couple of decades getting into, uh, and I put uh, messages between the chambers uh, in that uh, category, and I, I appreciate uh, you recognizing me. I yield back. Uh, Ms. Torres, any questions? No questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Perlmutter. I have a couple. Um, to the modernization uh, committee members, um, the, the question I had, in it, and we've seen it in a, a number of different proposals that we've had, is uh, how to uh, streamline and modernize the calendar and uh, be more efficient uh, in our travel and more efficient in our work, work days, if you will. Um, I'm curious uh, what you all concluded in, in our kind of summary of what you're proposed. It's pretty general. Uh, we've, we've got some more specific uh, proposals, but generally, what did uh, your committee come up with? Um, maybe I'll take first crack of that if, and then if either of uh, 
your rules committee colleagues who served on the select committee want to weigh in as well. I welcome that. Um, so uh, we focus primarily on principles rather than on proposing a specific calendar. And one of the pr principles that we look, that we proposed was that there should be more days in session than travel days. Uh, I, I think last calendar year we had 65 full days and 65 travel days um, uh, in session. And, and you know, again, if the notion is, you know, how do we have Congress work best for the American people? Uh, I would argue we need to increase time legislating. Uh, and uh, so reducing the amount of time in transit is important. The other thing we looked at, though, was the productivity of the time that we have. And the Bipartisan Policy Center did, I think, a, a very um, strong report uh, looking at the conflicts that exist between committees. They looked at one day and found on just one morning, 131 members of the House had a conflict between two or more committees. And so the concern, of course, is, you know, if, uh, you know, and I don't raise that as an individual member who feels like I need a clone to attend all my committee meetings, but rather as someone who thinks that important learning and work is intended to happen in committees, you know, that work is challenged when folks aren't there. And that can negatively impact the ability of Congress to, to deliver. And so we made recommendations in that space as well to create, uh, 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 to encourage blocked scheduling when committees meet um, uh, to uh, create a common committee calendar portal so that committees can have visibility into other committee activities and potential uh, conflicts for their members. Um, you know, over COVID, you've actually seen the House uh, do committee only uh, weeks. And I think that has been very positively received uh, by members, you know, where you have days that are committee activity only without floor activity. So we recommend con recommended continuing that uh, as well, just to try to drive as, mo as much productivity as possible. The other thing, and I'll just, I'll mention uh, quickly, and it may not seem like a big deal, but related to the calendar, we also said that the congressional calendar should accommodate a bipartisan member retreat because actually having Democrats and Republicans engage one another to try to advance an agenda and to try to enhance civility was something that the 12 members of our committee all felt were um, important efforts. Thank you. Uh, and for Ms. Murphy, a question more, you might be a, the two thirds uh, proposal on MTRs, um, kind of your logic behind that, please. Sure. Um, so MTRs are often presented um, at the very last minute uh, on the floor with very little time available for um, for members to consider what the MTR is actually saying. And I have to say, having had to you know do that all all Congress, this those MTRs are so poorly written. Sometimes it's hard to read it and figure out exactly what the MTR is trying to do, um, bumping it up against uh, the legislation that it's, the law that it's trying to change. So one, MTRs uh, are written a bit haphazardly. Um, they're introduced with very little time for members to review and understand uh, the impacts. And then finally, if you're gonna make a change to a bill that has already come through the entire process and has had, um, you know, consideration, debate, um, and you're going to throw something on at the last minute, it really shouldn't be uh, pass and be a part of that bill, succeed, successfully be a part of that bill, unless it meets a higher threshold, I think. Um, and we just picked the threshold that suspension bills do that, you know, of course, it, you know, with a suspension bill, it, that that's the level that would say, okay, th this is harmless enough. Enough people um, uh, would agree with this that we should we should make this last you know this change. And I just think you know when you allow a bill to um, be added with just simple majority, when it's gone through this very short and sloppy process, um, it makes it ends up making for bad legislation. I mean, we have a process for a reason. I don't want to um, take away minority rights at all. And, and I think I don't want to um, eliminate an MTR. But I think if an MTR is going to have the impact of law, then it should pass a higher threshold 
um, than a simple majority. Thank you. And then last question for you, Mr. Taylor. So, um, you know, there's a desire, and, and I, I think we all share the, the same desire to see legislation move through both chambers and, and get to the uh, executive and signed. And I don't care whether it's a Democratic Senate or a Republican Senate. I, we've all, uh, I remember in my first four years here, we had a Democratic Senate, but we'd send stuff and it kind of get all boxed up over there. And how do you think in the proposals you're suggesting, I mean, I don't want it just to be a one way street that we pass everything that the Senate sends to us, but everything we send to them gets bottled up. So how, how do you think this helps that? Well, again, I think we're in a position to start you know, going to the senators and saying, look, you know, we're, we're doing a 290 rule for your bills. You should do something like that for our bills. Uh, we're doing an over and eligible rule for your bills to expedite your bills. I mean, to improve the probability of your companion legislation uh, passing, uh, you should do a similar. And I've already, I've already had that conversation saying, look, we're, I'm going to offer this in the House. This is a common sense thing. Nobody's cut out. Everybody gets their say. You know, the committee chair, the speaker gets their say, the author gets their say. Uh, but I think, I think, it, but it, it, I think we, we, one of the, the divides, one of the divides, as I described to my constituents, everybody sees the partisan divide. What they don't see is the camel divide. There is, there is a lack of interaction between the two legislative chambers that is a little, that's striking to me. Uh, I actually, before I got here, I read the House rules and the Senate rules because I wanted to see who had floor privileges. Uh, could I go on the Senate floor? Could the House senators come on the House floor? And I actually got an argument with two members that, that were that had served here for several Congresses who insisted to me that senators couldn't be on the House floor unless they were former House members. Uh, and so under no circumstances could House members go on the Senate floor. I'm like, no, no, you're wrong. Senate rules are 27. They, we could go on their floor. But just but even if that's technically true, culturally, it's not true. Uh, the, the, we, we have a lack of interaction between the, between the chambers. One of the intents of both over eligible and 290, if 290 for Senate bills, is that it encourages senators to come and work their bills, to come to the House floor and say, hey, uh, I really want you on, I want your signature because I'm at 270 signatures. And if you sign on, I can, I can finally get to 290 and get this thing on the president's desk. And so having, so, so beginning, and, and, and also it encourages uh, uh, companion legislation, over and eligible encourages companion legislation. One of the advantages of companion legislation, I was a state legislator in Texas. One of the advantages of that is that sometimes you can't, you in, in your chamber can't figure out where the problem is, but the companion legislator figures out where the problem is. And they send you, here's the fix. I found out what the problem is. And they wouldn't tell you because of these reasons, but I found out what the problem is. And so I put this amendment on and now it's good. So here we go. Uh, you're ready to go. So I think, I think you have to begin with a, a step of faith and just start working on their stuff. Uh, and, and, and there, let's just say, I will say this, for every 10 bills that are sent from the House to the Senate, the Senate sells or sends one back. They're a far more effective legislative body from a volume point of view than they are without, there's no, no there's no, there can be no debate about that. Um, I believe that that's because their, con our consent calendar is basically a 95% cons consent calendar. Their consent calendar is unanimous and having an incredibly high bar uh, makes it very difficult for them to play small ball, to do smaller things. And they, until they drop that from unanimous to 90% or 80% or some other more more reasonable number, uh, they continue to have bills get blocked because somebody wants a better cubby hole over in the over the Capitol. And that and that that's happened. All right. Thank, thank, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morelli. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, frankly just want to uh, thank each of the members, I think their suggestions, uh, while I may not uh, also agree with each of them, I think they're very thoughtful and uh, appreciate their participation. I also want to, uh, if I can, at the risk of singling out uh, Mr. Kilmer and the members of the Modernization Committee, I um, there's a lot to uh, take in on the list that I, I have in front of me, but uh, obviously some of the, the changes that would allow us to have an electronic system for many of the things that right now have to be done in the physical world, uh, I would embrace. I think they make a whole lot of sense. Um, the other thing that I would just say, is, just as a general observation of what Mr. Kilmer talked about is the ability for members in committees to really take advantage of witnesses who are in front of the committees and engage in a little more thoughtful dialogue instead of uh, what at times to me 
appears to be making speeches. It's the one of the one of the things that I particularly appreciate about this committee is the ability to have uh, more uh, back and forth and to really ask questions. And, I, and that's why I value uh, these opportunities and, and whenever a rule is before the House or before the committee. Um, so I appreciate his thoughtfulness on that uh, as well. With that, I will yield back, Mr. Chair. Ms. Scanlon. I'm going to pass, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shalala. No, I'll pass, very thoughtful. Okay. I, I yield back. Did I, I, did I miss anybody? What, what a question? Okay. I, I think we're all set. I want to thank the panels for being here. You you are now dismissed. And then we're going to be calling our next panel will be Mr. Schneider and Mr. Schneider and Mr. Lou. And uh, as they're getting ready to testify, I want to ask unanimous consent to insert into the record testimony from uh, Kathleen Ms., uh, Ms. Kathleen Rice, Garrett Graves, Katie Porter, Emmanuel Cleaver, Josh Gottheimer. I also uh, ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the regulations to accompany H uh, Res 965. And I will now turn this over to Mr. Schneider. Uh, thank you. Um, I very much appreciate the, the opportunity to speak with you. I wanna thank uh, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the committee for hosting um, today's hearing to solicit ideas uh, from members uh, on rules for our next uh, 117th Congress. I'd like to discuss my views on the motion to recommit as outlined in Rule 19. As a majoritarian institution, the MTR represents one of the last opportunities in the House for those in the minority to influence legislation being considered on the floor. In principle, I support the MTR as a procedure that keeps debate alive and retains minority rights within the House. In practice, however, the minority party, both Democrats and Republicans, use the MTR as a partisan cudgel or just as often an attempt to artificially create a wedge issue. Using the MTR as a wedge along partisan fault lines is certainly the prerogative of the minority party. And again, both Democrats and Republicans have used the MTR toward that end over the decades. But what has been different this Congress and what I find not just reprehensible, but in fact dangerous, is the Republican use of American Jews, Jewish heritage, and the long fought battle against the scourge of anti-Semitism to divide us. The great seal of the United States bears the motto, E Pluribus Uno, out of many, one. It reflects the national ethos that has long given strength to our nation. It should be a principle that unites us. So it is concerning when any group of Americans is used as a prop to sow division. Using American Jews who have long faced bigotry and very real threats of violence is something altogether different. The alt-right Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017 and subsequent attacks in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Poway, California are examples that dominate the news, but they are just the tip of the iceberg. According to the Anti-Defamation League, or ADL, anti-Semitic incidents increased by 12% in the United States in 2019 and marked the highest number in AD ADL's four decades of record keeping. I have no doubt that all my colleagues on both sides of the aisle oppose bigotry and hatred in any form, including anti-Semitism. And so no party should ever assert that there is anything but unanimous opposition within the House against anti-Semitism. To do otherwise raises the risk of empowering those who traffic in hate and who would like nothing more than to believe that they have allies within the U.S. Congress who support their anti-Semitic views. I want to repeat myself. The MTR provides a venue for debate on worthy issues of divergent opinions. But when action on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives dehumanizes any group, in this case, American Jews facing anti-Semitism, it diminishes the institution and does a disservice to our nation. The cynical ploy of weaponizing anti-Semitism for political gain is as offensive as it is dangerous. Again, MTR should be a tool to insert healthy debate within the legislative process, and parties may choose to use it to push their agenda or put the majority party on the record. My minority parties should not, however, cynically use any of our citizens or group of citizens as a wedge or a pawn. We don't know who will be in the majority in the next Congress. I believe, therefore, that we can now take this opportunity to prohibit the use of MTRs in the next Congress until there is a bipartisan agreement that, while we can and often should invoke controversial issues on policy disagreements, we must never use the MTR 
that subvert our common goal of condemning anti-Semitism. I support the MTR as a way to retain the minority's voice in the legislative pr process, but I refuse to condone how it has been used by Republicans this Congress to infer Democrats or any member of this body are not sufficiently opposed to anti-Semitism. I also support proposals to require a higher bar for passage of an MTR, such as requiring two thirds of votes for passage, similar to suspension bills. When we're legislating on the fly, as is the case with MTRs, it's important that we get the details right. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak on how MTRs have been used in this Congress. And with that, I yield back. Thank you uh, very much. Mr. Liu. Uh, thank you, Chairman McGovern and uh, Ranking Member Cole for holding this Members' Day and for all the members' committee for your time. I'm going to talk about two subjects. The first is my proposal on inherent contempt, and the second is about the MTR. Inherent contempt is a power that a House of Representatives already has. The Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld this power. Congress has repeatedly used it in the past. My proposal simply puts in procedures in the House rules to let us execute this power. Specifically, inherent contempt gives us the ability to enforce congressional subpoenas. And in my proposal, it does that through the imposition of a fine for witnesses who do not comply with congressional subpoenas. And this is not a partisan issue. We have seen Congress over time cede way too much of our power to the administrative and executive agencies and to the executive branch. Both Democratic and Republican administrations have thumbed their noses at congressional oversight, although I have to say the Trump administration has done it way more than other administrations. And what this rule change does is it provides Uh, witnesses uh, in this process. So, for example, it uh, creates a process for dialogue between uh, the witness and the committee. Uh, it puts in procedures for the witness uh, to lodge objections. It puts in procedures for the administration to lodge privilege objections. It uh, the witness to negotiate, but at some point it allows the committee to then forward a resolution to the House floor where the chairman of the committee will present and then members can ask questions. And at some point it allows the house to vote on an imposition of a fine. And if that passes by a majority vote, then the witness will in fact be fined in the first increment of up to 25,000. But again, before that can be imposed, it puts in another 20 day delay for negotiations to continue. So there are numerous due process protections uh, for witnesses, uh, for the administration, but at the end of the day, if the administration or a private witness is going to simply not comply with the congressional subpoena, then the full house can impose a fine of up to 25,000 in the first increment. And if it continues, then we can compose, uh, impose a fine of up to $100,000 uh, at the end of the day. So that's my proposal. And it's, uh, again, also not partisan in a sense that I fully believe Joe Biden is going to win in November. And I think many of you do as well. This would apply to the Biden administration. And so I would seek favorable uh, consideration of this proposal. And then I'd like to talk about the motion to recommit. First of all, it's just a stupid way to govern. What does this process do? It literally hides language from the members of Congress. And then the language is dropped in and gives us about 15 minutes to cast a vote. But that is not really governing. That's called a game. That's what makes the American people hate us that we played these games. And it was wrong when we did it to you. It was wrong when the Democrats were a minority and we did this to the Republicans. It's wrong that you do it to us. This is not to actually substantively influence legislation. This is simply to play games on the taxpayer's dime. That's what makes it so offensive. And I also reject the notion that somehow this is the ability for the minority party to speak. It is not. The minority party has numerous ways to influence legislation. You get to participate in committees get to introduce amendments in committees. And then when the bill leaves the committee, you get to introduce amendments in the rules committee. If in fact there's a problem with a bill uh, that's about to be voted on the floor, then what happens is the whole purpose, or one of the purposes of your committee that you're on, the rules committee, is to allow amendments to that bill. And then the minority party gets to speak about the bill on the House floor. The minority party can go to the press. There's so many ways to influence legislation. The MTR is not designed to do that. And in practice, it doesn't even do that. None of the MTO proposals are real or actual substantive changes. 
They're just designed to be gotcha moments for the members of Congress. And again, this is a procedure where literally the language is hidden from the vast majority of the members of Congress, and then we're asked to vote on it. We just have to get rid of motion to recommit, stop playing these games on taxpayers' dime. It doesn't make any sense to continue any form of motion to recommit. We should not be playing these games. We should be trying to actually make substantive legislation and not do an end round around the Rules Committee. With that, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, yeah, no, I look. Um, I appreciate your, your your words. Just on the inherent contempt uh, issue, I, you know, I, I've been frustrated as well at the lack of cooperation um, with subpoenas that have been issued by committees uh, here in the House. But um, if we oppose the fine, um, I mean, uh, it, it, I don't know what that fine would be, uh, but to compel some of the people who, do, who don't want to comply with subpoenas in this administration, it would have to be very, very high because a lot of these people are multi-millionaires and billionaires. And, um, you know, you just wonder whether they would just rather pay the fine. And then on the other hand, you know, if, if it was, if, if you, um, if you had a different uh, Congress that, you know, was, uh, and they were trying to compel a, a government worker um, to come and testify, but that government worker may be told by his or her advisor not to come, you know, uh, and here's somebody on a government worker's salary, whether or not they'd be bankrupted, uh, you know, if it were abused. And I'm just trying to figure out, I, I, because I, I, the idea that, I think we need to do something because we can't, uh, what has been going on um, with lack of compliance uh, and lack of respect for Congress is unacceptable. Uh, I just want to make sure that, that that we've thought this out and that we're doing this in the in the in, in the way that is most compelling. Um, and, and I don't know if you have any response to that. You have to unmute. Un unmute. Uh, thank you uh, for right. those questions. Uh, you're absolutely right that if someone is super wealthy, uh, then this isn't going to work. Uh, that's also a function of our capitalist system. People who are super wealthy, for example, get tax breaks that uh, none of us on this committee uh, get. Um, and so, yes, that is a problem. I'm not sure we can fix that. And people who are super wealthy do get certain advantages. However, the vast majority of people subjected to congressional subpoenas are not like Wilbur Ross. Uh, they are not, in fact, super wealthy. So I think this would have a deterrent effect. Uh, there is... Um, room in this uh, proposal to allow the head of the agency uh, to uh, be fined. Uh, we can do it so that we go after the head of the agency if in fact they're the ones that are uh, ordering a subordinate to not come. So uh, that's a modification that uh, can, can definitely be made. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Woodall. The, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll start where you left off uh, with Mr. Blue. I, I think it's absolutely critical that uh, that we are able to compel the executive branch to comply with, with uh, congressional subpoenas. Um, I think our challenge has been the partisanship here in the in, in, in our chamber. Uh, it's it was obvious to you that the the Trump administration uh, was uh, was practicing this obstruction uh, more than any other. Uh, I came to town in 2011, uh, so my first vote uh, uh, on along these lines was our criminal contempt resolution against Attorney General Holder, uh, which passed the House, uh, was referred to the Justice Department, and then the Attorney General decided he was not uh, going to pursue the criminal contempt uh, resolution against himself. Um, it passed in a largely partisan way. I think we had 17 Democrats vote with us. But the problem uh, was not that we were not able to issue the subpoena or pass the contempt resolution. It's that the enforcement, which ought to be zeroing out somebody's budget, uh, making sure the, the, the head of the agency doesn't get their pet project funded, all of these things that we ought to be doing together, uh, uh, we end up being divided on. And, and I fear collecting those fines would be yet another one of those things. Uh, given that you've spent some time uh, uh, thinking about this and, and constructive ways to solve it, uh, did you come across something that would 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 uh, lead to us passing more of these uh, subpoenas and contempt resolutions uh, in a partnership fashion than in the fairly partisan fashion that we've seen? 
so thank you, Representative Woodall, for your question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, and I noted in my opening statement, both Democratic and Republican administrations have uh, thumbed their noses at Congress. Uh, so to me, this is not a partisan issue. It's simply uh, taking back, it's not even taking back our power. We already have this power. The Supreme Court has, in fact, upheld it, and Congress has used it in the past. I'm just putting in procedures to allow us to execute it uh, if we want to. Uh, we still don't have to execute this power next term, but at least there's an option to do that. And right now, it just seems sort of silly for us to have no ability to execute that option, even though we have the power uh, to do so. Um, and it is my hope that we could get more subpoenas uh, issued on a bipartisan basis. I think that would, in fact, be better uh, for the institution. You may recall Republicans grappled with this when we were in control and, and went down the line of, uh, of uh, creating procedures to zero out an individual government employee's salary if we didn't like uh, the way they were treating Congress. And to Mr. McGovern's point, uh, creates a uh, incredibly uh, 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 punishing tool uh, to just your, your average government uh, worker who had no idea they were getting ready to get dragged into a, uh, into a congressional fight. But I, I do hope that we can solve that because I believe that we are both, irrespective of who leads the Congress, irrespective of who leads the White House, uh, we are all disadvantaged as Americans uh, when Congress uh, becomes feckless in its attempt to, to do oversight over the executive branch. Uh, let me go now to the motion to uh, to recommit. Um, I, you know, they taught me in freshman orientation 10 years ago that that was just a procedural motion. It had no policy aspect to it whatsoever. And so just vote no. Uh, and so uh, I, I recognize that that is not the sign of something that is valuable legislation. Uh, that's the sign of, uh, of of something that you would think could go by the wayside. But in our very new era of having almost all closed rules all the time, right? Not a single open rule in Paul Ryan uh, uh, in Paul Ryan's administration. Uh, not a single open rule now uh, in uh, Speaker Pelosi's uh, it, it, uh, uh, operation. Uh, there is no opportunity sometimes for the minority to have input on the House floor. If we had open rules, the challenges would be very much the same as the ones you pointed to, uh, Mr. Liu. Those, those uh, uh, amendments are offered, uh, dropped right there on the floor, can be written on the back of a cocktail napkin, no opportunity for the uh, uh, for legislative uh, 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 drafting and, and perfection. Folks don't have time to consult with their staff. And, and under the five-minute rule, 10 minutes later, uh, you could be asked to vote uh, on a very consequential uh, amendment that, that had not uh, been seen before. So, so last-minute uh, legislative language used to be a hallmark of this institution wasn't used to disrupt the institution. It was just, a, it was just common as a, as a function of the legislative uh, process. I remember once uh, uh, on our prescription drug bill last year, the majority saw in its wisdom the, uh, uh, the ability to offer the minority uh, an amendment in the nature of a substitute. And in exchange, the minority said, and we're not going to press for our motion to recommit. We traded away what you and I would both uh, agree was a, not a particularly effective legislative tool. And in exchange, we got a very substantive conversation about how we wanted to reform prescription drugs uh, uh, in the in the country. I, I support uh, I support that. Um, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about Mr. Schneider's concerns because I, I I raised the very same issues in the Rules Committee last night, uh, Mr. Schneider. We were talking about a bill that was uh, a resolution that was intended to speak out against horrific uh, treatment uh, that has been alleged uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, non-citizens uh, in the country after they have been detained uh, by federal uh, forces. And, and the uh, resolution, I believed, was designed to divide us on something that we should have been speaking in one voice uh, to condemn, that there's no benefit in America of having it appear that someone condones uh, inhumane treatment uh, by uh, by federal uh, authorities uh, against uh, 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 non-citizens. Um, so is it clear to you that there is a difference, uh, the, the occasional majority bills that are brought to the floor for a vote that are designed apparently to divide us as opposed to unite us versus the motion to recommit, which I would absolutely concede 
is often designed uh, as something that it would makes it appear that we are divided uh, when in fact we may not be so. No, um, thank you. I, I, I appreciate the question. The distinction I would draw here is it, it's never good to divide us, but that's part of the politics and, and, and part of the process here. It's using a group as a pawn, as the wedge to create that division to try to create a false impression of antagonism to a group or a, an, in, an individual that doesn't actually exist, um, that I think becomes so dangerous. And my concern specifically with respect to the use of, of American Jews and, and the issue of anti-Semitism in our country, which as noted with the ADL numbers is on the rise in the country as it is around the world, we are empowering groups that are um, traffic in, in anti-Semitism. And we are diminishing groups that are being used as, as the wedge. They, I think back on some of those motions to recommit that I'm sure uh, uh, you are referring to. I would often say we were talking about um, uh, uh, protecting uh, uh, this group uh, or that from some, some groups that rightfully need protection. And the motion to recommit said, yes, those things are important, uh, but someone needs to speak out against anti-Semitism, and they're not. Someone needs to speak out against anti-Israel sentiment, and they're not. Uh, someone needs to do these things, and so we're going to we're going to do this. We can't move legislation to the floor on our own, and so we're going to put it in 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 this uh, in this context. Uh, I we in our last panel we heard uh, uh, members uh, uh, on both sides of the aisle talk about the need to protect the motion. Uh, to recommit. Uh, I do hope that we can find a way to make it more valuable uh, as a legislative uh, tool, but I am, I, I could not agree with you more uh, that the politics of division that we play have dangerous consequences in, in many ways. Again, I believe not being able to speak with one voice uh, on behalf of non-citizens in U.S. custody uh, is dangerous uh, because it suggests that something is acceptable when it in fact is not. Uh, and that is certainly true as, as it relates to, uh, to anti-Semitism. And so I would be, I'd be happy to, uh, to, uh, to work with you uh, in, in, a, in a Republican majority, as we're sure to see in January. Uh, it, I, I want you to know I'll be just as willing to partner with you as I am uh, in, a, in a Democratic majority uh, uh, today. And I, and I, 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 I appreciate that. And, and in all our interactions, we've always had good comedy. And I think it's that comedy that allows us to put forward uh, policies that advance the interests of the nation. Uh, there will be arguments and there will be divisions of opinion, but we should never use individuals or groups of individuals as a pawn in advancing that cause. They, I'll just share with you, I, I don't believe our conversations in the Modernization Committee are privileged uh, any longer. We tried not to, to out one another while those conversations were going on, but, but we grappled with the motion to recommit because uh, folks uh, did have such strong feelings about it. And I, uh, while it was not, uh, while reforming it was in our, in our final recommendations, I thought one of the more fruitful places was how can we encourage the minority to surrender uh, that motion in favor of getting a more substantive uh, legislative uh, alternative uh, path. Uh, let's not use the, let's not eliminate the motion to recommit to silence the minority. Let's let's change the motion to recommit to empower legislative discussion and just give the minority one opportunity to take it where they'd like to uh, like to take it. And so I, I, your your counsel as well, well taken, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Torres. No questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. I have a couple comments, um, and I'd like to just start where uh, Rob and, and Brad just left off. And I had not opposed uh, MTRs before as a as a general principle, but the the MTR from a week ago on anti-Semitism um, really bothered me in a in a whole range of ways. And and obviously, as a member of the Rules Committee, we say, okay, it's procedural, you know. And I sort of went down that path, and I voted against it, and then it uh, passed. And then we vote on the bill as amended by the MTR, and every single Republican voted against the bill with that amendment. 
And we had Mr. Klein on just a few minutes ago, and he talked about the Virginia rule where if you amend something, then you vote for the bill. Well, that, that doesn't seem to be uh, commonplace <laughs> at, around this place, but I, I was making some fundraising calls. And a guy answers, he says, why'd you vote? Why are you anti-Semitic? It was, he didn't say it quite like that. Why'd you vote against the uh, anti-Semitism amendment, Ed? I didn't, you know, I just, I don't understand. I said, it was procedural. I said, but then I voted for the bill. So it was part of the bill. And I said, all those guys who presented the amendment, it was just a phony baloney stunt because they all voted against the bill. And it, it, it did create precisely what Brad is concerned about. That, that I could say all the Republicans were anti-Semitic and he could say he was worried that any Democrat who voted against the amendment was anti-Semitic. And it just really went right to right here for me. I mean, that's a core value thing for me. And so I, I, I have to admit I'm, um, I'm attracted to, to Mr. Liu's proposition here on MTRs that uh, what is the value of them? You know, is this really something important that it's the last word for the minority? Is that really something or is it a gotcha thing? And we certainly did it. You know, we would we would do our uh, MTRs. So I I have some uh, reservation about these things that I didn't have until about last week. And so I just I want to raise that. And I, I guess my other comment to, to Mr. Liu on the inherent contempt is uh, the enforcement component that Mr. Woodall raised. That what are we going to do? Add to the Capitol Police? Are we going to get fines? Are we going to sell somebody's house on the courthouse steps? I mean, I just don't understand how we have the... I, I don't understand what you would put into place to actually enforce something in some substantial way. So I guess I'm, I'm just presenting that to you, uh, Mr. Liu, because I do have some skepticism about this. Uh, Could I answer that? Sure. All right, so right now, uh, in fact, our congressional subpoenas can be enforced, uh, as Mr. Woodall pointed out when they went after Attorney General Holder. Towards the end, that was enforced. It just took many years. Because the way we enforce it, we have to litigate it through the courts, meaning the district court, the appellate court, and the U.S. Supreme Court. So it literally takes years to, enter, to enforce a congressional subpoena. Now, the difference with this proposal is, let's say you assess a $100,000 fine ultimately on a witness. And yes, it will be litigated through the courts. But at the end of the day, if the witness is wrong on the issue, and the courts find that, yes, with the ability to enforce this subpoena is lawfully ordered, that witness will be on the hook for $100,000. So it flips the burden where the witness now knows if they ignore the congressional subpoena, they could in fact be on the hook for a lot of money at the end of the day. We'll take the Don McGann case, for example. We've been litigating that issue through the district court, through the appellate court, it hasn't even been uh, gone up to the Supreme Court yet. At some point, there'll be a decision. And let's say we in Congress win. Well, what happens? Dom again then, you know, comes in and he testifies. But if there was also a threat that he might think, oh, I might also be on the hook for $100,000, I don't know if he actually would uh, ignore the congressional subpoena. So that's that's a difference. It, it puts uh, it, it, this burden on the administration uh, that if they lose, uh, they could be on the hook. So I guess I just follow up and then I yield back. So let's say we get a hundred thousand dollars. So that you, you in in your uh, scenario, the court said yes, it's a hundred thousand dollar fine, and then we got to go collect through the courts. That's what I was saying. Auction it on the courthouse steps. I you know, see, are we really going to do that? Right. Be the same way that the courts right now impose fines uh, on people who ignore court orders. And yes, there will be at some point uh, a collection would would occur. Okay, thanks. I, I appreciate that. I just have a little, I'm not sure that we have the staying power to do that, but I, I hear you and I, I yield back to the to the chair. Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. 
Mr. Morelli. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, add my thanks to Mr. Schneider and Mr. Liu for their thoughtful comments and for the opportunity to uh, have them in front of us. I'll yield back. Ms. Shalala. No questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, and um, I think Mr. Raskin uh, may have some, see if Mr. Raskin. Can. So we're going to have to do a recess to hear. Sherman? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Raskin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I just uh, I wanted to say a word about uh, Mr. Liu's proposal, which I think is and, and put your video on, please. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now, Mr. Chairman? I can hear you, but I, we can't see you. We need your video. Ah, okay. I thought it was on. Okay. There you go. There we go. Um, I, I just wanted to say a word on behalf of Mr. Liu's proposal. Um, you know, but I, at a, a certain point uh, earlier in this Congress, I looked at the Supreme Court precedent uh, governing um, contempt of Congress, going back to Anderson versus Dunn. Um, and I mean, this really goes back to the beginning of the Congress. And the Supreme Court has been very clear from the beginning that Congress has the same institutional authority to impose sanctions for disobedience of its orders that a court has. And, um, you know, as, uh, as a body equal in stature and um, uh, powers to the Supreme Court, we have the authority to enforce our orders. And if we don't have that, then the lawmaking function is fatally compromised because it's inherent in lawmaking that we have the power to obtain the information that we need. Um, and you know, James Madison was very clear about this when he said that those who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. And so what does it mean for us to have the power to legislate over all of these subjects, over war and foreign policy and commerce and bankruptcy and piracy and banking and you name it, if we can't get the information that we need? Um, so the lawmaking power implies the power to go out and collect information, the power of subpoena, the power to have people come and testify before us. And if we get an executive uh, branch, if we get a president of whatever political party or persuasion who decides to thumb his nose at Congress or give the finger to Congress, that's a crisis in our form of government. And so we need to have the full panoply of uh, powers to enforce our own orders. And uh, obviously that's something that goes way beyond any particular party or any particular president. But we are uh, the preeminent branch of government. The reason we're in Article One, we come first, like the First Amendment and all of its rights comes first. And um, you know the reason why the Congress has the power to impeach the president and the president doesn't have the power to impeach us is because we are the lawmaking power and the representatives of the people. So uh, with all that, I just want to say I think. I'm in very strong support of what Mr. Liu is doing, and I think that we've got to move a process forward that allows us to make the inherent contempt power not just latent within uh, our arsenal, but something that is explicit and right there so people understand it. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, does any other member of the committee wish to ask a question? Seeing none, I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony. You are now excused. Um, are there any other members who wish to testify on proposed rule changes for the 117th Congress? Last chance. <laughs> Seeing none, this closes our member day hearing. So without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>